welcome to a very hot afternoon today. We are pretty much driving around with no destination for the time being. Um, yeah, I haven't thought of this plan too well for this afternoon. I think maybe elephants and hyenas should be the plan for the afternoon. What do you guys think? I think hyenas for sure because I really want to see those tiny little ones. I am so dying to see them all again and just I know that the females had some very big bellies this morning so hopefully they will stick around there and just not go too far. I am hoping that is going to be the case however I want to do a bit of more of an excursion before I get all the way there and see if I get lucky with any elephants around here. I haven't been around again and I'm starting to miss them. It was funny how a few weeks ago we would just drive out of the lodge and then just find elephants everywhere and now it's just like a rare thing and also buffalo. I could, I would really like to see a buffalo just because we haven't seen any and because I'm particularly fond of them. <laughs> sure, maybe I should be nicer to buffalo. Alright, off on the road we go. Heading all the way to the eastern side. I wonder if perhaps we will bump into that strange, mysterious female leopard that had an impala carcass off an Amarula tree in one of the most visible spots and we didn't even see it. And I was so surprised when Taylor said where he was because the tawny eagle that she saw and the vulture that she saw, we stopped there. We were looking around and obviously not considering too much of what was around us. So it's, I'm sure this leopard has been in there watching us for days driving past and <laughs> Just not too bothered. So I wonder if perhaps it's because there are rumors of a very skittish leopard around the lodge that's been moving around. We don't know who it is, and I wonder if perhaps it's not Anchila, because Anchila is somewhat nervous around vehicles, or she's not as an extrovert in terms of humankind. If I can maybe say that that's what she is, but she is still quite relax with the vehicles not like a very skittish leopard so I wonder if we have someone that's come from Bofusuk maybe Vanilletti side that is just not all that friendly Ooh, this mic pack is hurting me but at least the day is very nice and warm we were freezing this morning and now it seems like maybe we can enjoy a very lovely afternoon out here the wind is I just self-attacked ourselves. <laughs> so there was a, <laughs> there was a tree on the road that we went over and then it just pulled a bunch of sand in my face. <laughs> okay then. <laughs> That's that for a wake-up call. <laughs> Did you get any? Ah oh, yeah. I did it for you. I got it all in my face. <laughs> <laughs> right, hopefully that will be the last time that I do that don't really want to start spraying all of the sand on my face although who knows might be a good sunblock today considering that I forgot to put some on maybe my face is going to turn bright red maybe my arms will turn darker hmm Alrighty, Mvula, where art thou? Not. Uh, I don't know if you even crossed back from Bufusuk this afternoon. Hmm. Alright, I am going to leave you guys for the next little while, but we will see you once the show starts. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. The kudu have already started playing hide and seek with us this afternoon on the sunset safari. This is Safari Live. Good 
afternoon everybody and welcome to another Sunset Safari. My name is Taylor and on camera with me today is Sebastian. Woo! And we are hopefully going to find just as many animals as we found earlier on this morning if you joined us for the Sunrise Safari. Now of course this is live and interactive so if you have any questions for us I look forward to hearing from all of you today you can hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Now we haven't really got a plan just yet other than I'm hoping to see some elephants today that would be quite nice and then I believe Ali is also wanting to see elephants today and we might go and scratch around on the southern boundary to see if Tandy has decided to pop back across if you did miss the drive this morning we had Tandy she tried to stalk a squirrel and then she let some impala get away from her which was quite sad uh, <laughs> but anyway so I'm sure she's still looking for something to eat but unfortunately some sad news might as well get that all out of the way Mara won't be joining us today so you're stuck with another girl drive woohoo Ali girl power so hopefully we'll be able to bring you all sorts of wonderful action it's a lovely warm day today so I, I'm got a good feeling that we might see some elephants out here, which will be really, really nice. We have gone a couple of days without seeing them, and I think we need them in our lives. So we'll also go and drive around on Chitwa too. We'll scratch around there, check around those big open plains. Maybe we get a beautiful sighting of some elephants crossing through. Ah, could you? Crossing through the Marulas. It's really quite nice. I'm just going to go. How, is that a gap for you? Do you need me to go back a little bit? Oh, perfect. Okay. There we go. So we first up. Well, you saw the kudu just a moment ago. Those ones weren't cooperating. They kept moving around and out of frame. We thought we were going to start on leaves. It was a, a reality for us. But it is a kudu cow, and she does have a youngster who's following behind her, and we'll catch up in just a moment. Now, they don't seem to be bothered by our presence at all, which is quite nice. They're almost, in fact, walking straight towards us. But I think it's because she wants to nibble on that little shrub and also stand in the shade because it is hot. So that's what the animals do. Just as you and I, well, I suppose we would stand in an air-conditioned room, or if you're a guide, you'd make best friends with a chef and go and hide in the walk-in fridge, <laughs> in the freezer. That was always my favorite spot. But the animals, they don't have that luxury. They've got to use the shade created by all the trees. And then certain animals will, of course, also go and bathe themselves in nice, cool water. Or if you're a buffalo, an elephant, you don't mind sort of wallowing around in the mud. But it's a little one. Probably only about a month, maybe two months old now. Oh, lovely. And this is actually quite cool because what's happening now, this is one's following mom, but mom's walking up onto the top of a termite mound. Off they go. So I wonder if she's going to go and stand right on top of the termite mound to scan the area. Well, it seems as though the little one's going to go up before her. Come on, little one. Tell us what you see. You've obviously spotted us. Video Jumper, you've said that this is your favorite antelope. They are beautiful. I like all the antelope in the Tragolaphid family, so the family of antelope with spiraled horns. We saw a beautiful bushbuck ram just outside camp before we left and this afternoon too. They're frequent visitors along with the Inyala. We don't see too many kudu coming into camp. It's, it's just the pesky bushbuck and Inyala that come and eat my tomato and chili plants. They're very naughty. I now have none left. It's upsetting. I'm going to have to try again in spring. But big ears, good eyesight. So standing up on this termite mound would be a very good spot. And like we always say, coming into winter, the vegetation's thinning out, so they really are able to utilize these mounds quite well now. And they can see quite far off into the distance. And also there seems to be some tasty grass up there that they are enjoying. That little wire that you can see, that's just the aerial. I'm a bit reluctant to move. And the reason why I don't want to start the car is because I know that they're then going to just run down the mound. And it is such a beautiful sighting. But look at that. Look at Sebastian. How amazing. Just very gracefully reached over to the back, grabbed the aerial. <laughs> And moved it out of his shot. So <laughs> here we go. That's probably why the little one got a bit of a fright. It was like, what are you trying to do? There's a couple of little shrubs also growing right on the top of that termite mound. So that mound doesn't look particularly active. Normally those mounds are quite bare, but termites will try and utilize all the vegetation that's right around their house rather than have to move too far away. So if it's covered in grass like this, 
I'm almost confident in saying that there's nothing happening in the top section, perhaps down below. There could be some of those very intelligent insects living down there. But for now, it's working quite well for these kudu. They're having lunch with a view, I suppose. And this is as high as a vantage point that a kudu can get up in the northern sands. There unfortunately are not any copies, any rocky outcrops or anything like that up here. It's fairly flat, but we get some rather large termite mounds. This is not the biggest one. They can definitely get larger. Isn't that great though? I'm so sorry, Alice, can I have that question again? I was too distracted. Ah, now Alexander, you're wondering how fast can kudu run? Now, I'm not sure how fast they can actually go. They're, they're quite speedy when you see them racing away from wild dogs. That's when I've seen kudu run the fastest is when they're actually um, trying to avoid <clears throat> being snatched up by a pack of wild dogs. So I'm going to I'm going to guess here. Let's see how close I am. Maybe somebody can help me. I'm just trying to think if my book I've got a mammals book here. I don't know if it's going to have it in. I'm going to say, Sebastian, I'm going to, we're going to guess now and then we'll check for the correct answer. I think about 60 kilometers an hour. How fast do you think a kudu can get to? Um, we'll play a guessing game and then I'll check it up. Yeah. 40, between 40 and 50. You think between 40 and 50 kilometers an hour. So we'll see who's who's closest. And of course, this is a, a learning spot here. I'll check in my book. I do know, however, could you might not be the fastest antelope out there. They're not related to the tessabees. So even the red heart beast is quite quick. That's a cousin of the tessabi. And um, they can jump really high, though, the kudu. So they are quite athletic. They can clear the game fences um, quite easily. They can jump up to about three meters from a standstill. Can you imagine that? There's no athlete out here without the use of a pole that could jump as high as a kudu. I think the pole vaulters would be impressed with the kudu. Right, and I'm trying to find antelope in this book. I've found them. But now there's every different species of antelope in Africa. So I've just got to find the right ones. Where are the trachelaphids? No, that's springbuck. That's not the right family. Isn't this a beautiful scene? Now, it's not often that we get to sit with kudu. Woo, okay, Izzy, Izzy, you've said 70 kilometers. That's quite good. We'll, 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 we'll 100% check as well what my book says. It might vary slightly. This is very frustrating because I love this book. It's one of my favorite books. But to try and find anything in here is a nightmare. It really is not the easiest book to use. And then you have to go, oh my goodness. Izzy, we might just have to take your word for it and go with 70 kilometers an hour. It's so, I give up. No. I'm not interested. <laughs> no, all the patience in the world <laughs> to sit with a leopard for an entire game drive that's just inching its way to try and get down a warthog burrow. But no patience when it comes to looking through a book. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll have a look at the book now. I just need a moment to compose myself. So while I do that, let's go back across to Ali and see how fast she thinks a kudu can run. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to this wonderful afternoon out here in Safari. Let me just stop this vehicle. It takes a little while because we've got not, well, no brakes. My name is Ali and on camera with me today is Gert and we are very happy to have you guys today. Now, as you know, it's a live and interactive show. So if you've got any questions or any comments, please feel free to send them using the hashtag the hashtag safari live now my plan for the afternoon was to pretty much focus on hyenas and elephants but i've just come from the den and they were not out <laughs> so i'm very very sad because the little ones are probably just inside of the termite mount and i couldn't see any adults so there's no point in staying um just to put unnecessary pressure in the area so what i'm going to do is i'm going to leave and then i'm going to try again later on this afternoon see if perhaps they are there because these hyenas just don't know how stubborn i am because i really want to get to know all of them so, long-term goal for the afternoon is to come back, but in the meantime, I don't know, I think my plan has just changed. Some Ellie's in the water would be nice, elephants at Buffalo Sook Dam, that's where my aim is this afternoon, so hopefully that will be it. Now, I believe Taylor was discussing 
uh, how fast kudos run i think it's about 50 60 kilometers an hour if i'm not mistaken perhaps a little bit quicker than that but i could be way off so hopefully taylor will have a better answer once she manages to check the book and see how fast they are I don't think, however, that they are able to sustain that speed for too long because they normally live in very thick areas. So their main way of escaping predators is, yes, running far, but just hiding into the bushes. Now, what they are very well known for is jumping very high. So I think maybe that's the best way that they've got to escape. But let's see, there's a nice group of kudu that we see around this area quite often. So I wonder if... They're going to be around this afternoon, also on the termite mounts. Good indication that all of them are using the termite mounts is that the grass is still quite long. So, elephants of the Kruger, come, come to us. We're waiting for you. Yeah, that is roughly where Kruger is, just more to our east, where the sun is not shining from. All right. I thought I had smelled some of that unique popcorn smell, very typical of when leopards go scent marky. But I think what I want to do as well is go see, seeing it's on my route to Bufozuk Dam where the tailor had that carcass, see if perhaps we can find it again. Because who knows, or maybe it'll be just a mystery carcass. Maybe there wasn't really a carcass at all. And that was just a parallel universe. <laughs> maybe. Not too sure. Seems like up here though, it's a bit quiet. There aren't too many water sources around this particular spot. So maybe that just drags the animal even more to the corner. So they'll either go to the Gauri Dam, where the dam cam is, or they'll go far away into Sydney's Dam, which is all the way to the to the west from where we are. Or if not, Bovosuk Dam, which is all the way to the east from here. So, interesting times ahead. And I wonder, maybe we'll pick up on more tracks for that strange female leopard that Taylor saw this morning. That apparently was quite ne sneaky, that leopard. She even walked on top of my vehicle tracks after we had driven past. She came and then she walked on there. So I, I'm guessing that maybe she went back to the to the carcass to see what there was around there. And then she, did it, she considered that it was finished, there wasn't enough, and then carried on and moved off. Suppose it's a good... Um, Good lesson. Ah, Taylor's already managed to find the elephant, so let's go over to her and see what those beautiful creatures are up to this afternoon. Ellie, you have no idea how lucky we seem to be over the last few days. But it is indeed a big elephant bull, and we've just missed him. Sebastian and I are kicking ourselves. He was just at Treehouse Dam. We must have missed him maybe by 10 minutes or so. If, maybe if we hadn't spent as much time with those kudu, we could have seen him splashing about in the water. But a beautiful lad, nonetheless. And I'm happy that we've managed to find, even if it is just one elephant on his own. But he looks quite, I think he looks beautiful with all the different colors that he's got over himself at the moment. Obviously those light patches are from sand and some parts of it also just because he didn't get any water and mud on his body and then the darker bits are from all the lovely water. He didn't do a very good job though, that was a, a half-hearted sort of splash about in the water. It's not exceptionally hot so we, we don't normally see the elephants spending too much time at the uh, water at this time of the year splashing themselves. They'll just go down, have a quick sip of water, maybe a couple of trunkfuls sprayed over their body just to help cool them down, maybe to keep the flies at bay too. But other than that, that's all. And I really hope that this giant doesn't move too far into the thicket because we might lose him. He's actually moved quite far off of the road now. He's just following a big animal pathway off to go and obviously feed on something delicious. I wonder if there are any more elephants around here. We will go and check twin dams around Baboon Pan. Of course, we're looking for a leopard. We might find some elephants coming through here. He wasn't a very old bull either. He looked not ginormous, average sized elephant bull I would say. I would probably put him in his in his early 30s. Some oxpeckers flying overhead too. Looking for their next target to land on. Don't think you're going to go down to the elephant. No. No, circling. 
Maybe he's practicing to be a vulture, that one. You can just, you can't, it's difficult to see him, but you can sort of just uh, hear him above us. Now he's gone. You obviously realize that. Nah, elephant's not what I'm looking for. I shall go somewhere else. But sadly, I think we might have to wait for this elephant to pop out on the other side. Actually, if I go forward, we might get another view of him. Shall I try that? And I believe we're breaking the internet now too with they're trying to figure out what the speed of a kudu is. Now the book that I have, which is, it's a specialist book on animal behavior, talks about how high they can jump, but it doesn't say anything about their speed. So unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to help you, but perhaps Ali has got, oh, it's a tough one. Perhaps ali has got another book with her. Uh, all books are slightly different. Obviously it's everybody's opinion and their experiences of the various animals in different areas. Um, I don't think I just said that. Why am I repeating myself today? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Aaron, it's a very intelligent answer that you've given by saying that the speed of a kudu probably depends on what type of uh, prey is chasing it. I do concur. That's why I say the fastest I've ever seen a kudu run was after uh, wild dogs were tailing behind it. Uh, I didn't think that they could move so fast. Like I said, I know and I've seen kudu jumping over massive game fences before and it is spectacular to see something so large and, and then also being so athletic. So it'll be somewhere between, I reckon, between 60 and 70 kilometers an hour. We can say roughly. I don't know if there's anyone out there that has ever timed a kudu or done a race against a kudu. So until we have that day, we won't know. Now you might hear a bit of noise just in the distance. It's an aeroplane, just a small aircraft, obviously taking off from Chitwa Chitwa, which is not too far from here, or maybe even Arethusa. Obviously dropped some guests off. You can also hear the song of a crested barbet. It's just singing out and about at the moment. There seems to be a duet going on at the moment. Now the elephant, he's just going to carry on eating for most of the day. He's had a cool down and I think he'll enjoy himself in this wooded area. Lots of bush willows, lots of round leaf teak marulas, all sorts of his favorite fruit, maybe even a trunk full of grass. Here and there, if he sticks it under some shrubs and gets the nice green bit still. But there he goes, right behind the bushes. Let's go towards Twin Dams. Maybe we get lucky and we find some more elephants there. And we'll keep coming and checking around this area. We'll pop out on the fire break a little bit later. So something, something to look forward to. Okay, I'm gonna send you back into Ali's vehicle now and uh, see what she's got planned for the rest of the afternoon. Well, surviving some of the roads is part of my plan. Now I want to come back onto this area a little bit later on because it seems like in Vula was left somewhere just north of us on the Buffalo Sook side, but who knows, maybe he'll come back down into this general direction. I know I would really like to see him as I haven't been able to see him since I don't know, it's, I think it's last time I saw him was about a month, probably a little bit more than that, so hopefully he'll be somewhere around here this afternoon. Now this, this discovery that Taylor made of that carcass on top of the tree just has put this area onto a completely new, under a new light for me. So I can't believe there's been a carcass and a leopard feeding off of it for so many days in an area that's relatively open and because we're so used to not seeing creatures here we're just like oh you know and you just don't pay attention and it just shows how well camouflaged everything is. I think maybe I'm gonna need to get me a new pair of glasses or something like that or my first pair of reading glasses or maybe my leopard spotting glasses I should call them that maybe get them with leopard print and they can do work their magic. All right, now I think that impala up the tree was a bit further down the road, but now I'm a bit nervous that I, because I've missed it already that I'm going to miss it again, so who knows. But we are checking very carefully just out of curiosity and so far though no leopard tracks on the road. So whoever it is that made that kill hasn't come back and that leopard that was walking on top of our tracks this morning also doesn't seem to have traveled around this particular road. Outrageous. It's a very nice afternoon today, nice and hot. I think the weather is 24 and 
74 if I'm not mistaken. Very nice and hot. Ah, 24 and 76, I almost got it right. I don't think my brain has that ability of converting things into different, I, I learn the conversion every single time and I'm like, okay, this time I will remember it and it doesn't ever happen. I think my brain can only think in metric. <laughs> All right, Guide Impala, where are you? Lots of tracks here. Big Marula here, no Impala's here. No Impala there. I think maybe this is the area where you guys had Mbula. I heard, yeah, yesterday. I think I remember all those off-road tracks from this morning when we first driving, first just uh, first started driving around here. I can't even speak now. All right, guys, where? All right, Marula tree, Marula tree. Maybe we won't see anything proving that it's well camouflaged. <laughs> marula tree, marula tree. Mm, more marulas. I think it was here. Because this is where we had that Tony Eagle this morning. Did you see it? My goodness. Marula tree. Interesting. So it's definitely well hidden because I think it was somewhere around here, somewhere. And definitely here because we had that Tony Eagle here that flew around. And I think maybe towards, I don't know. Maybe it is a mystery after all. No carcass up here. Maybe Taylor needs to show me properly. <laughs> maybe the carcass has been taken down. I will find this. All right. I think maybe up this way. Let's try and see if we can see it around here. I am feeling quite like a poor tracker right now because I can't find a dead impala on top of a tree. Maybe I got the directions wrong and the drainage line wrong. Oh well. I think we're gonna carry on and look for living things rather. Let's go look for elephants at Buffalsuk Dam, see if perhaps they'll be around here. And I think this mystery shall remain a mystery, just like the leopard intended it to be. And hopefully the God would be wonderful. All right, I'm officially giving up on, on the dead impalas on top of trees. I don't think there's any around here. I think maybe I got the directions wrong, so I'm gonna carry on and look for the living. Seems like Taylor's bumbling along, so let's go over to her. Perhaps she will spot another carcass on top of a tree leading to somebody else. I think I was so lucky with finding that alley right place at the right time and a question at the perfect spot too, making me turn around. So. I don't know, it's, um, I'm trying to think of how I can explain it, but it, it would be quite um, quite difficult if you didn't know which marula to look in, because there were quite a few, and they were, like I said earlier, we're talking about the vultures perhaps knocking it out of the tree, there were lots of little branches, so it is, it is concealed. Now we've just arrived at Twin Dams, who's just dived into the water, I think it's terrapins, yep, lots of terrapins diving into the water, but otherwise not much else unfortunately just quite a bit of glare let's see if any of them are going to pop their heads up oh I looked along Gari Main he actually has one tiny little terrapin down there just floating I don't know if you can see it the others have gone MIA now it's a very little one floating I don't think it realizes that we can see it but other than that so far it's been Pretty quiet. Did it go away? Where did it go? Oh, it's how did that happen so quickly? How's that? Oh, there we go. Here's a big one. It's swimming. <laughs> no, come back. 
Everything's hiding from us now. Perhaps that's all the luck we're going to have for the safari. We're seeing that elephant. Oh, the terrapins are not playing ball today. Okay, fine. It's very rude of you terrapins. What we'll do is we'll have to find the beautiful big terrapins that live around um, Chitwa Dam. Now, I've seen a squirrel though. It looks like it's going to chase the starling. Can you see it? It's just running along the long grass. There it goes, just about to disappear. So it just came out of a bush willow tree and it's obviously come down to try and have a look for any little nuts or things that maybe it's stored or stashed away. Leslie, you said that we normally see so many birds at this dam. Where have they all gone? Well, that was great. That little squirrel was very nimble. Perhaps it's playing, uh, training for Ninja Warrior going to do all sorts of things. Leslie, I don't know where all the birds have gone. You know, we, we see this every now and then. It's the same thing at Voyatella Dam with the dam cam. We obviously are able to watch that all the time. And I reckon the bird numbers have completely dropped too. We used to have the white-faced whistling ducks living there. Mr. and Mrs. Blacksmith Lapwing we obviously saw this morning and um, an intruder. Uh, the little three-bander plovers are around sometimes. The odd dove and pigeon comes down to drink. But I suppose it's just this time of the year. Wait when we get to summer again. Although, no, now it should be nice during the day because it is warmer, so all the little birds are coming down. I'm perhaps just not being patient enough. Now, where are we going to go from here? I think we're going to go back. We're going to go through the Mulwati and I'm going to try my luck around Ledwood Road and Cheetah Cut Line, I think, for now. We'll just have a quick scratch around there. We've just got a bit of a way to go. Just check, triple check for any tracks. Nothing. So Ali said to me that she thought uh, Tandi had actually come towards Baboon Pan. Apparently there was a giraffe just in Little Gowrie, just out of our view. And it was staring down at something in the drainage line. Now, it wouldn't surprise me if the giraffe had spotted the leopard. She was coming straight towards this area. She could have also turned back and and go back the other way again, the way she came. Now, Aaron, you would like to see a giraffe. Well, if we see one, it'll be for you, Aaron. But so far, nothing with a long neck. Just check very carefully here. There's some nice shady spots for a leopard to hide away in. Especially because it did get quite warm today. No. Doesn't look like she's popped out onto the road either. Let's go down, down, down into the Mulwati and see what we can see down here. That's uh, no leopard tracks. Nothing. Up in the tops of trees. Good spots. No, it doesn't look like there are any leopards around here. Okay, well, we'll keep giving it a bash around here. Perhaps Ellie and I are going to have to start with a bird challenge, seeing as all the rest of the animals are hiding away. What do you think, Ali? Hmm, Taylor, maybe we should. I am approaching Buffalo Dam, so I'm hoping I will be able to tick up some birds or start accumulating birds for the challenge here. And we'll trust everyone to keep score for us. Although, whew, thankfully, luckily, this morning we didn't actually keep numbers because I think Taylor definitely would have won. Now. Let's see what there is around Bufuzuk Dam. It's looking very eerie today. Lots of impala. That is a good thing. Seems like we've just missed them coming down for a drink. As I see, the whole herd is up on the top on the dam wall, and then the rest of them have gone down. Now I want to maybe spend a little bit here, see if perhaps we can start racking some birds and add them onto our list, but let's have a look around and see what it is that we can find here. Maybe one day we should also do a tree challenge. Hey, Taylor. Matt, you're 10 years old and you're wondering where the hippos have gone off to. Um, I am wondering the same thing. I think there is just one. 
No, it just seems to be dirt. Never mind. Um, so hippos can move from dam to dam, and maybe perhaps the hippo over here has gone to Treehouse Dam. Perhaps it's gone to another bigger dam somewhere on Buffalo and Torchwood. They don't have to stay in the same dam all the time, although they prefer it. Now the hippo that lives in this dam, he's been a bit shy lately, so I wouldn't be surprised if he's actually listening to me talking all this nonsense about him not being around and he's just underneath the water hiding out. So I think maybe let's just stick around for a few moments and see if there's a head that pops up. If not, then I think we're going to have to say that this hippo has migrated. I wonder. I don't think it's the same one that we saw at Treehouse Dam this morning because uh, the one at Treehouse Dam is quite shy and rarely puts his head out. Or who knows, maybe this hippo thinks that he's going away from the paparazzi just by going to Treehouse Dam and pretending he's not around. Hmm. Now, I think let's start seeing if we can find any beautiful birds around here. Alright, there is one little plover all the way in front. All right, we'll show you one little bird. There it is, the first one's for our list, the three-banded plover. We're going to stick around here and see if perhaps we can see anything else around here. But while we do that, let's go over to Taylor, who has managed to find very fresh signs of Tandy. camera's going to shake just slightly it's because I'm trying to climb out of the car as gracefully as I could now yes you can see fresh leopard dung this was not here this morning which is a great sign for us that's very very good news uh, actually I want to poke it. it sounds bizarre that I want to poke dung I want to have a look and then I'll also show her her tracks okay so let me show you her tracks very quickly with a stick if you look over here there's a little footprint one, two, three, the, uh, the three lobes, so that it tells us straight away it's a cat. And of course, it's not particularly big in size. I'll put my hand this way. It's probably about the third of the size of my hand. So I know it's Tandy. She was right in here. This is where we had to leave her. Now, this is this dung. Still quite soft. I don't think this is particularly old. Now, I wonder if she's done this because she's now had another meal. Maybe she went in there and she managed to capture one of the other impalas that we could hear making a bit of noise. Right, so we'll go and have a look. Let's do that. So let's carry on trying to follow the track. This is the hard part now, is trying to stay on the track. So I'm going to go exceptionally slowly and I'm going to look very carefully on the ground. So I do apologize if it may seem like I'm neglecting you. I promise I'm not neglecting you. I just want to find you a leopard. And I know that you'll be very thankful if I can find your leopard. So the tracks are coming this way. They're not going back just yet. So if she has killed something, she'll go and look for Tamba. And I'm hoping that this is what happens. See, now I don't have the tracks because the ground is quite hard around here. But we know she came from Chitwa site. So let's go towards Chitwa. And I think the closest water would be at this, uh, this pan just opposite Cheetah Cut Line. We'll just check, there's no point checking down here on the ground, the, the road is absolutely terrible, it's so hard. But here are some sandy patches. Let's just confirm that she keeps coming up this way. See, now I don't have any tracks. Let's just go right off of the road here and just make sure she didn't decide to walk on the other side. No. Hmm, let's just go and check up at the pan anyway. Let's do that. Now, Sharon, you're wondering if she could be scent marking the area. Oh yeah, most certainly. And she was doing so this morning as she was walking about. But remember, uh, when a leopard, is, if she is going just about on a, a territorial patrol, if there's anything that pops up that she could catch, she will try and get it too. But it's just unusual that we watched her go all this way and now she's come back, almost using the same route. So I wonder if she maybe didn't use exactly the same route and actually crossed back into Little Gari. This turns into Chitwa Chitwa just now. Hello, Hornbill. So we're tracking leopards. We'll, we'll have a look at you a little bit later. 
Hmm. There's some more leopard tracks here. Let's keep going. Let's check that watering hole. We'll go up and see if we can. See any of her footprints. I did, I did think she had a drink this morning because at one point we didn't see her for about two or three minutes. She'd stopped down in that little ditch and that's where there's a fair amount of water. We'll just keep checking here. We're not far away from the dam now. Sneaky girl. Also a couple of elephant tracks scattered around here. Let's go in and have a look. Let's go in right here, in fact. Oh, it's dried up. I can't believe that. I didn't realize there wasn't any water in this pan. Look at this. And this was full not so long ago. Just seems to be a virtual styling, hopping around. You can see our shadows, I'll wave. <laughs> There's a little virtual styling. Also, I think looking for insects that would maybe be coming down to drink or to get a bit of moisture off of this damp mud. And I can see a ground scraper thrush. I'm actually gonna reposition for you. I'm gonna go just around the bend here because I wanna see if there are any tracks coming out. And then there's a tiny little rise. I think it's a piece of dung, but there is a ground scraper thrush sitting on it. Can you see it? Just running off just to the left of that massive animal pathway. You can just see it just up ahead. Uh, okay. Here we got it. There it is. It's a nice bird. I like these ones. They're one of my favorite birds. I love their yellow legs and the markings, the black markings they have against the white stands out and very easy bird to identify. Okay, so that's quite interesting. I think I can hear a safari vehicle, which is really good news because now I can chat to them and tell them what I've found. Come this way, please. Right, let me quickly move onto the road. And wait for them. Where are you? Pick us. Where's the safari car? Are oh, you not coming this way? It doesn't look like there's any footprints around here. Again, the ground is actually quite hard. So let's check. Yeah, because this is the direction that she came from. Do you have to really focus when you're looking for animals? No, I don't know where that car has gone. No, there's no sign of a leopard here at all. She could have taken a shortcut. She could have gone anywhere, in fact. Perhaps we'll have to go back to the last position and go on foot and just sort of see where exactly they go. But while I do that, I'm going to send you back across to Ali, who's doing a bit of birding. We are trying to, but it's getting a bit complicated because the birds, of course, will not stand still. But there's a bird party here, so I just want to maybe try and move a little bit further ahead. See if we can have a look into those bushes on the left-hand side and maybe dig for any birds that are there. Because I, I see some blue wax bills. There's been a drungo fluttering around. So I want to see if maybe there are some other interesting little birds that could be there. Where did you go, little blue wax bill? Um, so, towards here. Up here. Mm. I can hear lots of little things here. There we go, there's the blue wax bill that we were talking about. Common little things, hard to spot because they never stand still. Mm. Find them in little flocks every so often now. There are, I can hear so many birds around us and it's a bit frustrating because I can't really see any other birds other than this wax bill that's now, of course, flown away. Hmm, let me just quickly check. Keep a scan around with the good old trusty binoculars. There sounds like a cysticula somewhere around here. Hmm, nope. Run away, sorry. All right.
Let's maybe reposition. I think there is a great go away bird somewhere around here because I just hear the very characteristic. I'm gonna try really not to get offended by this. Little gray go away bird that I cannot see but I can hear perfectly well. <laughs> bye bye, guys. Lots of little wax bills flying here. Now, let's see. I think there are some more in this tree ahead of us. This bunch. Video Jumper, you say you love wax bills because they've got beautiful colors. I agree with you. I just wish that they would kind of stand still for a while longer. I also really like the the fire finches that are very similar to the wax bills, but they are they have more brown and some of them reddish colors, and they can be so beautiful. Now, I think all these little creatures are becoming a bit tricky. Come on, guys. Lots of little wax bills fluttering around. Mm. Let's see, maybe in that dead tree ahead of us. Nope, nothing there. I can hear you, Sisticulus. Where are you? That beep, 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 beep. That's them. Hmm. All right, I think I'm starting to become a bit crazy here. Too many good places for all of you to hide. No wonder you don't get eaten by anything. All right. It's a bit tricky with such small birds to try and show them on the camera. Crow Pal, you're wondering what my favorite bird is. My favorite birds are oxpeckers. I think they're some of the cheekiest creatures out here and I just laugh every time they go into any animal's ears. It is very funny and ironically because they tend to go into rhino's ears a lot because the skin inside of the of a rhino's ear is slightly thinner so it's easier for them to just pick on the text people for a long time believe that uh, oxpeckers would actually nest inside of the ear of a rhino. <laughs> Which, of course, was then disproven, but, <laughs> but it would be a very fun notion, imagine, just having little eggs carrying them around. I'm sure that wouldn't have been nice for the rhino's sense of hearing. Now, at least we've got a very cooperative drungo all the way up there. And now I'm trying to rack on the common birds before Taylor either finds a lot of spots or a wonderful bird party in an area that's a bit more friendly. So there we go. The Drungo, Fork-tailed Drungo, it's his full name, and you can see why. Well, the tail looks pretty much like a fork. Now, there's a very similar species of bird around this area that's called the black flycatcher, and it's just slightly smaller, and the tail, instead of being uh, forky like this one, it's actually round. But it looks very, very similar, especially if you're just catching a glance. And I think a few days ago, I was actually looking at one of them, but because I just saw a black bird, I automatically assume it was a drungo, and then upon further inspection, we realized that I was wrong. That it was actually a black flycatcher. All right, thank you, drungo. Much obliged. At least you were out there. You can always count on the drungos to be there. Now, I've been very lucky with elephants on this road, but it seems like maybe not today might not be the day. And it's very thick and lots of little birds flying around. So we could hear quite a few of them, but perhaps not see too many of them. Hmm. Let's see if maybe we can find another bird party in an area that's slightly less thick. And have a look there. There are some old signs of elephants being around here. Perhaps nobody's been down the, this highway in a few days and that's why everything's dried off the way it has. Oh, having said that, not too far from here there's that nest for those hawk eagles. Might take us a while to get there, but I'm sure we could slowly find our way down there, see if perhaps they finish with the nest or if either one of the eagles is there. I would really like to see them because every time that I've driven past there in the last few weeks, they haven't really been around. So, might be a good idea to go and check up on them and see if how they're doing, if they're still around, and how life is in general. Now, 
Where are you guys? Any birds? Interesting, not too much. Hmm. hmm, seems like Taylor has found some more tracks, so let's go over to her and see how the tracking is going. Now, I apologize if you look at me because my shirt is all very wet and I thought I'd tell the story and just provide a bit of entertainment. I took a sip of water from my bottle and then touched the brakes at the same time and it was a disaster because basically all the water just poured down my throat, down my neck and also down my shirt which is now left me. It was quite refreshing though, it was really quite nice. Sorry Sebastian, I should have splashed a bit back mm -hmm. at you on this warm day. That's not the reason why we've, we've actually stopped here. I've stopped to just take a look at the, the leopard tracks and there is another car coming and I will have a chat with them. So this is Tandy, she's walked here, she's turned, it might be difficult to see but she has sprayed her urine up here so she's definitely marking her territory but I can't really see too much of uh, of the urine let me get back in the car but we know she's come here ah right oh no my this is coming undone my little little straps to also hold all the things in place now I'm just gonna take a moment you can look at the beautiful scenery to the left how lovely are those Tamboiti trees isn't that fantastic hi how are you I'm very well. Hello, hello. So, Tandy's come back from this way. Okay. Her machimba's there, and then all her tracks come up. She marks against that quarry, but now I don't have any more. I know she came this morning from the new Chitwa Chitwa driveway, so I might go all the way around and just check. Maybe she's going to fetch Tamba. Okay, I'll let you know though. Keep you updated. Cool, good luck. Right, we're back. We're back again, so just quickly chatting away here about where this leopard could potentially be so Sebastian and I were also chatting and and I bumped into Dylan Brent's brother and he said that he'd found Tandy this morning from the Chitra Chitra new driveway um, as you heard me saying now to Rolf so so now I'm confused because they've come from that way and they didn't report any tracks but we'll just go anyway maybe she stopped to have a little rest Maybe she hasn't made a kill at all, because so we are only just speculating. So we'll go all the way around there. We'll go on Shurumbi Rombi, back towards the driveway, and then maybe check in some of those roads closer towards uh, the Cheetah Plains driveway. And uh, there's some nice roads, and you know, Tandy is no stranger to that end of the world. But we'll just keep checking. But still, there's absolutely nothing here now, nothing fresh. There, was, there are some leopard tracks, but from when she was walking down uh, this morning, other than that it's a tough one but we'll keep searching hopefully we'll be able to man or we'll have blah, 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 blah. I'm gonna have to have some more water and this time try not to spill it down my shirt otherwise we'll run out uh, we'll hopefully find something now Ellie's ahead in the birds I think that makes me a bit nervous let's look for a little bird party very quickly perhaps we can get some and Alice is just confirming my suspicions that she's indeed ahead of us you know what i'm going to do as well i'm just going to very quickly just check here on cheetah cut line just a little bit to see if she didn't change her route completely nope just in pile of tracks now if you're wondering how on earth you can spot a leopard track so quickly because it, i mean it didn't look like i was really staring down onto the ground but i promise i was it's just that as you start guiding, here's a go-away bird, or two go-away birds. It's gonna move forward, are you eating? I'm gonna go creep slowly, see, can you get them, is that a better gap? They're just eating berries. And the reason why I'm able to, of course, spot the track so easy, it's, it's just because we see them all the time. So you start to notice things that look like they shouldn't belong on the ground. There's even a little polyrhynchus ant moving around behind that go-away bird. And it is eating berries of some sort. What tree are you on? Looks like one of the senners that it's hopping about. Maybe it's not eating berries. I couldn't quite see what it was grabbing off there. But typically the go away birds are fruit eaters. Maybe it's pecking at the pods. Is that what you're doing? Yes. Oh, <laughs> did you see the go away bird on the right hand side? It, it sort of stretched over to try and get one of those pods from the center and then fell off of the branch. Please tell me, um, Megan and Alice, did you see that happen? 
Yeah, there's another go away bird laughing at you. Oh, it was funny. Look at them. They're doing acrobats now. Now, you do realize, birds, that you're not supposed to put your tail over the top of your head. Otherwise, gravity is indeed going to take its toll. Obviously, these birds weren't concentrating when they were in their science classes, but look what they're feeding on. So not feeding on traditional fruits like they normally would eat, but making use of these pods. And you? There's another one that's not eating, and I think it's just laughing at these two as they do their silly acrobatic maneuvers. There they go, off they go now. Flying away, that was quite nice. It was a lovely go away bird sighting in fact. Gonna have to hold my arms out like this now to try and dry my shirt, because it's very wet. And then it's also quite nice, it's nice and cool as well when I do this. Okay, that's enough. All right, let's, let's continue our search, let's concentrate. Birds and spotted cats and elephants. That's what we're looking for. Birds, spotted cats, elephants. No spotted cats yet. There's a zebra. Maybe we should turn this into a mammal challenge and we might win. There's a whole herd of zebra. That's a nice gap. Natural framing by some apple leaves. We shall see in a moment. I keep parking poor Sebastian on the most bizarre slope, so then he has to rearrange the camera. Sorry, Sebastian, I'm making your job not particularly easy for you. But there's about, there's more than five zebra in there, which is probably the biggest herd we've seen in the last week or so, maybe even more. Maybe this is the McCurdy herdy, who knows? But they're on Chitwa Chitwa, and they look like they're gonna come right towards the road. Let me go forward for you again, Sebastian. I'll just go past this marula. Yes. I'm glad you spotted that. <laughs> no, we find a little gap, maybe if I go, yes. See, not all the zebra are wanting to stand in the same spot. So it's difficult to try and find a perfect little gap, but there's the rest of them just moving through. There's quite a few stripes behind that bush, but it looks like they're going to follow this one up in front. And I think it might be the stallion. They normally do take the lead. Let's see, yeah, that is a boy. That is the stallion, and the whole herd is now running out of the thicket and walking in the same spot. So we've actually got a nice position here. We'll get to see them all. We can count them now. One, not the stripes, because we'll be here all day if we try and count the stripes. We'll, we'll just count the animals. There's a second one, and there's a third one that we'll see in just a moment. And it looks like there's a foal with this mare. Where's the little one? It was still coming. No, it's stopped playing. Well, I think that has just stopped to play. Beautiful. Nice. So one, two, three, four. And here comes the little one running at the back. Five. Where's your friends? Six. And I think there's a seventh one too. Ashley, you said that you love zebras. I do too. They're really amazing animals to watch. We've had a lot of luck. Look at this little one's full of beans. There's an older older member of the herd that it can play with doesn't seem to have as much of a spring in its step as that youngster does and I enjoy watching zebra especially when they get a bit frisky and they do chase each other around they're quite comical it's just like watching horses really play in a paddock with each other they do exactly the same thing so seven zebras in this herd what a lovely size isn't that beautiful and I think Seb we might actually have to reverse again and try and get another view of them let me try that it's the stallion. I'll go right back. Oh, watch, now they're going to change direction. Don't do that. We just want to have a look at you. Okay, we'll stop here. That'll do. Here comes a little one. Racing stripes coming through there. I reckon that this little zebra needs to go and meet that hyena, that fluffy hyena we saw this morning. Look at that. <laughs> He's even squealing a little bit too. There's something biting your bottom. Do you see that tail's moving quite vigorously. I think it's maybe been stung. Video jumper, you said it is a playful little zebby. I actually think now that it's, it's being bitten and that's why it's resorting to cavorting around like this. Show me you're being stung. It wouldn't surprise me. Let me move back again for you. Sorry, Seb, we're doing a lot of maneuvering around here. But the zebra obviously haven't got the manual or haven't read the Sabi Sands guideline to Safari Live. Hi. 
No, no, it's okay. Relax. They're not relaxing. Don't be silly now. It's just us. See, now I know straight away that this is not the McCurdy Hurdy because they would never do this to me. They would never turn their backs to us and run away like that. And that, that is actually a stick that's going across your screen. I just switched off because they weren't 100% happy with us, but now they're, they've forgotten that we're even here and they should actually walk right past us. But shame, yes, I think that little one was having a bit of trouble. I'll never forget the one day I had a rather large thoroughbred. His name was London Class, and he was 17 two hands. Can you believe that? Oh, I'll move out. They're coming across the road. He was an absolute monster. When I bought him uh, at, as a four-year-old, I didn't think he was going to mature to that size. I learnt my lesson that 17 two hands is a horse that is way too big for me to ride. Anyway, he was naughty. He was very uh, sort of hot-tempered. Uh, it was typical of his sire um, and of London News. It's a, was, he was a very good racehorse, actually, and they were all quite fiery, and he had a very fiery personality. But I'm digressing now. The one day I was having a, a jumping lesson and a bee stung in between his legs, and he bucked like a bronco. Now, he was known for the best bucks in that stable yard. He bucked every single person off there, even some top, top riders. Oh, that's an injury. And, and yes, um, I fell off. So I know it's not pleasant when a horse gets stung by a bee. Now, I think this is zebra. Looks like it's been fighting a little bit, don't you think? Looks like there's quite a, quite a few scratches there. But that looks like a typical hoof to the rear end. That does not look like uh, it's been attacked by a lion or anything because I've had to spray much purple spray on injuries just like that. It looks exactly like it has been kicked and zebras do get a bit rowdy at times. Like I was saying, they become very, very playful and if, if you've ever seen a zebra fight before, wow, they, they can get quite aggressive. Yes, I know you keep running back to mom for reassurance and look at that tail go. Come here. If you come to me, I'll have a look for you and there's something biting you. That's mean of the flies too, picking on the young foal. <laughs> That's terrible of them. But what a lovely zebra sighting. I'm just shifting out of the way now. It's always interesting the positions we have to lay in to make sure we don't get our heads in. Sometimes my ponytail creeps into the frame. I can't help it, it has a mind of its own. Little one, have you settled down now? It doesn't seem to be sort of tucking its legs underneath itself like it was earlier and all of the zebra's tails are swatting quite a bit, so the biting flies are definitely around. Whee! And even at a young age, I'll tell you right now that that would hurt if it kicked you like that. Obviously, it hasn't quite learned. Its tail's obviously not quite long enough yet to reach to those hard-to-get places, so a combination of bucking and shaking. <laughs> put your left right, what? put your left foot out, put your left foot in, put your left foot out and shake it all about. <laughs> <laughs> it is so sweet, but I also feel a little bit sorry for it. It's not enjoying itself. It's not very comfortable. Go and run through a tree, little one, and that's something that the zebra has still got to learn. Oh! <laughs> Bucking bronco. I think you're in the wrong industry. You shouldn't be a safari wilderness zebra. <laughs> oh, no! Oh, my goodness! Shame, little one, and we watched that happen. I won't laugh at you. That was terrible. But it bounces back up, as you can see. Oh, no. Careful, you're going to slip again. But you saw it slipped right there. It fell, it got back up. It didn't hurt itself. They are so resilient, these little creatures, and it, it is just going to have to learn. Now, curious one, you've said that you enjoy active zebra sightings. So do I. You, it's hard not to and we don't get to see active sightings like this too often. I feel bad though, because I am laughing at the expense of the zebra, but I reckon everybody in the herd is probably having a bit of a giggle too. You'll get there, your tail will grow long enough one day, and you'll be able to sort those flies out. I think it's a combination of, a, of the flies biting it and maybe a little sugar boost. It's got all this excess energy. It's a bit like me, it gets distracted. Oh, that smells nice, I'm going to eat here and then I'm going to run and buck and chase all sorts of things again. How great is this? We have had some serious luck, Sebastian. So Sebastian and I were talking this morning, I was distraught because I'd left my watch at home and I've been waiting for this watch for such a long time. And I thought, I said, oh no, Sebastian, we're not gonna have good luck today because I left my lucky watch behind. It's not the watch that's lucky. So now we need to figure out what item that I'm wearing 
is very lucky because I didn't have this kind of luck last cycle or the cycle before. We actually had a drought when it came to animals. But it's changing and I'm quite happy with that. So I, I got given a necklace and I also got given a bangle. A rhino bangle. Maybe it's the rhino bangle, this one. That's actually, oh sorry, did you want to look at it? Yes. I'll just show you my pretty beads. There's my pretty beads. And it's got a little rhino on if you'd like to see. It says protect, it's upside down though. So maybe it's that. Possibly that's bringing me all my good luck, I'm not sure. Anyways, <laughs> it's now turned into Safari Labs Fashion Edition. Let's move up just a little bit. I do want to just maybe pull off of the road in case there is a car that comes from behind because this is we are on Gauri Main and that's why you are seeing the power lines in case you're wondering it's not a zoo we do have to bring electricity um, to this area actually let me go up here Can, no we can't go up here because this is not Juma anymore we're trapped we just okay we're gonna block the whole road that's what we're gonna do and we'll move when somebody gets here but very cool it's been a wonderful afternoon Hopefully it's going to be another game drive that we're basically going to blink my eyes and open them again and the Alice will be doing the countdown with me. It'll go really fast. I love the drives that are just so busy that you don't even get to check the time. Yes, stamp your feet, kick your legs, swish your tail. Those are all the right steps to trying to get rid of little insects. Ooh. Now, Carsten from Denmark, you're wondering at what age is a zebra considered fully grown? And um, I would say around maybe th three or four, no, well, well, a horse becomes fully grown in about six if it's a thoroughbred. If it's a warm blood, it's normally later, about seven, eight years old. They're normally only maturing at that sort of age. So zebra, I'm going to go with maybe four or five years old. Uh, the females will be able to uh, to breed at that age and I don't think they'll be doing too much more growing even, even with a stallion oh careful might just fill out slightly more so it won't get too much taller they normally would have reached their their sort of height by there by then sorry shame little one look at it breathing quite heavily now it's obviously warm and it has been running around bucking and racing around in circles and I'm sure swishing your tail like that too can use quite a bit of energy but luckily there's still an abundance of food around I wouldn't like to watch a zebra do that if we were in the peak of the drought because you just use all your resources all your fuel that you've been storing and you don't want to do that when there's not a lot of food around but that little zebra hasn't got to worry about a thing because it will still be suckling and at least mom will be able to keep producing enough milk that's another old injury now that one, that big cut along that zebra's back, sure, actually looks like it was quite deep at one point. Now that could again, could be from a lion, it could be running and cutting itself on a branch, a low hanging branch, that can happen too. I've also had a horse that's done that. It could be a, from a number of different things. But it seems as though they've been fighting quite a bit in this herd. Now, Mr. P, all the way from Canada, you're wondering if a zebra has ever killed a lion by kicking it. Um, most certainly, I'm sure that's definitely happened. I haven't ever seen it happen before, but I know that it doesn't look like much when that young foal was kicking about. But just put that behind a big stallion, and you can imagine what that must feel like. And they've also got exceptionally sharp teeth, so biting, kicking, very, very powerful hindquarters. One blow to a lion's head or to a lion's jaw um, could easily incapacitate it. So it could break a lion's jaw and there's no coming back from a broken jaw out here because you won't be able to eat. And in order to survive, you need to eat, of course. Um, or even breaking a lion's leg in the ribs, you know, um, getting internal bleeding, that's a possibility. So all the animals out here have got a chance at defending themselves against predators. That's why the antelope have horns, like we've just mentioned, the zebra have got very powerful hindquarters and very sharp teeth. Giraffe have got a very powerful kick too. And wildebeest and buffalo, they've got horns to try and protect themselves. They've all got natural camouflage. So they do definitely have a chance at, at getting away. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. Most of the time, the predators do succeed and do win. At this time of the year though, 
the predators have a better chance. In the summer months, once the animals start recovering from uh, winter, when the food was less and we've just come out of a drought, uh, they really are quite fit and strong. Right, we'll see what else these zebra get up to, otherwise we're going to continue on our leopard search and hopefully we'll find a spotted cat. But let's go back across to the leading bird lady, Ali. on the roller coaster. I think we have come all the way to Gary Dam just to have a look at the wildebeest migration that's going on around here. Do not go away guys. <laughs> we are just here to observe. We're not going to eat anyone. Well this is quite amazing. This is, I'm sure these were all of the ones that we saw earlier on today when we were... Mm, okay son, we... I think I'm gonna... sorry. Let me just go slightly forward and maybe we won't have that bright reflection of the sun right where it is. Maybe here is a bit better? No? All the way there. All the way there. Yes sir. All right, we are just trying to find a good angle where the sun is not going to be reflecting on the water ah, too much so that we can have a look at everything that's going on here. It seems like maybe the wildebeest of Juma have decided to put on a migration show for all of us. <laughs> Thank you guys, that was very kind of you. Now, if anybody needed a Mara, Mara fix, this is almost the way to go. <laughs> a bunch of wildebeest by the water. Um, sadly, no crocodiles here. So I think it's a good thing for them because they'll all be able to survive this watery encounter <laughs> coming down for a drink. And I'm sure this is the herd that we saw this morning. So there's about maybe 30 of them. Yeah, I would say about 30, 35 of them in total. Now someone's having fun there in the mud. Like we were saying earlier, it's been a hot day, so I wouldn't be surprised if they've just gone down uh, to the mud to where it's a bit cooler, so it feels a lot better to sit down there than pretty much anywhere else. Look at that! I can even pretend that we're in the Maasai Mara now, with this great wildebeest migration. Careful, you're wondering what's the name for a large group of wildebeest? Well, I suppose just a herd. Herd of wildebeest? I don't know if they've got any fancy names, but as far as I know, they're just simply called a herd of wildebeest. Now, we've got a few that are doing some very funny stuff by the edge of the water, and they keep, yeah, rolling around in the mud. Very buffalo slash elephant like of them. And I'm sure it's because it's been such a hot day, they're trying to cool themselves down, but I'm also trying to get rid of some of those annoying parasites that can live on their skin. Oh, guys, you're really enjoying this mud bath. Or, well, it's not a mud bath, but beauty treatment, perhaps? <laughs> Even the youngsters are doing it. I think this is quite unusual behavior and it's they, they're very happy to be close to the water because they have learned already that there aren't any potential predators in the water that might try and eat them. I think should we be in an area like the Maasai Mara where there are lots of crocodiles and lions lurking around waiting for the approaching wildebeest, likely that's when they're going to come and feel a bit more wary of the water sources. But like we said, this is a shrinking water hole. And I think it's the only one that is actually going to be pumped, if need be, throughout the winter time, so that there's always water here. But because there aren't any predators, the wildebeest have already known this fact, that they can approach it and just enjoy a lovely time by the water's edge. Well, this is pretty amazing, looking at them enjoying the mud so much. Stevie, you're wondering if these wildebeest will migrate to the Mara. Um, no, they will not migrate to the Mara. The wildebeest that we have in this part of the world, so in southern Africa, they because there's water readily available for them, they don't have to move too much. They might semi-migrate during the dry winter months from one area to the next, just where they can find water, but they will not go from here all the way to the Mara. I do think that there's some sort of... Um, 
theory that says that perhaps millions, well, not, maybe not millions, thousands of years ago, all of the animals used to migrate. And especially, I think it's been said that elephants used to go all the way from Southern Africa to East Africa. However, as human populations have evolved in the world and we have started building roads and putting fences, we have cut the migration for many animals. So they've had to readapt. And that is perhaps one of the reasons why the wildebeest that we have down here do not move around and do those great migrations that we see in between uh well the, the our winter months here but their summertime there <laughs> Classgate, you're wondering if female wildebeest have horns just like gazelles. Um, yes, they do. They have horns just like the males. Normally, bigger sized antelope, both males and females, tend to have horns. Uh, and they come into pretty much aid for their defense. So, males wildebeest and female wildebeest have got horns, which makes it sometimes a bit tricky to tell them apart from the distance. This is quite a wonderful setting. Interesting, guys. And now, around the water, there's shoots of grass that are probably a bit more palatable, still yummier to eat, more nutritious. So it's a perfect setting for them. They, they can play around in the water, have something to drink, and then eat food that's softer and more nutrient-rich than what they've been probably eating the whole day. Now we've got some, I think it's some youngsters down there still in the mud playing around with it. <laughs> Kelly, you're wondering what the lifespan of a wildebeest is. Uh, well, in the wild, I would put it somewhere around maybe 10, 12 years old. Probably on average, we would find that it's a little bit less than that, but that, that would be my normal average. But let me see if I've got a book here where I could double check that this fact is correct. <laughs> it seems like we've got a youngster quite enjoying life over there. Have a look. Could it not could it? I have lost one of my very trustworthy animal books. I am not too sure where I have put it, and that makes me worry quite a bit. All right, lifespan: 15 years. So, according to my trusty book, it's about 15 years. I would imagine that they, in reality, they live slightly less than that, just because of the hard conditions that they can live upon, and I assume also it's area dependent. But I think probably 15 years is a good average here. I would assume that the ones in the Mara perhaps live slightly less because they have to migrate. And as we all know, and as we've been seeing, lots of predators lurking around waiting for this time of abundance. Hmm. Interesting. So we're having like a mini bite-sized migration over here. I wonder if they're gonna head back to quarantine or if perhaps they're gonna go into greener pastures later on. And by greener, I just mean pastures that are not here because there's this is as green as it gets for this time of the year. Now, I don't know, I'm trying to think if there's any potential open area that they might enjoy, but I think it's quite thick all around here. So I would have imagined that they would just pretty much do a bit of a circle and go back to quarantine where we saw them this morning. Rero Maturda, you're wondering if wildebeest are raised for human consumption. Well, the uh, game game farms that pro I want to say produce, but that raise animals for human consumption. They don't do it in intensive as, for example, maybe cattle farmers. But yeah, they do sell wildebeest meat, and it's quite tasty. You'll often find that they'll give it or offer it to guests at the lodges if they want to try any of the wild meats. I think wildebeest, nyala, kudu is very popular as well. What other one, Kurt? Am I forgetting another? Meat anything. 
you can eat anything, <laughs> okay? That is probably true as well. But I think those are maybe the most common ones. But yes, there are... And in fact, I think in South Africa, a lot of people prefer eating, or it's very common to eat venison rather than cattle. Just because it is also believed that venison is a lot healthier than cattle. A lot of the times you'll just see that people will leave their... Uh, their game animals like the wildebeest or the nyala, they'll leave them to pasture and live freely before the time starts to, to cull them. I don't know, there's no way that I can talk nicely about culling of creatures, but it seems to be the preference. I've met quite a few game farmers that prefer venison over met. Sorry, Alice, you just said that a herd of wildebeest is also called an impossibility, is that correct? Implausibility. <laughs> okay, I didn't know that that was another n name, common name for an association of wildebeest, but I like it, and that's a very fun one. I think my favorite still of all time will still be a parliament of owls. Congress of Baboons. No, you see, I just hate politics so much, so <laughs> I, I don't really like that one. <laughs> you guys are having the lifestyle here, playing with all this muddy water. Yeah, you're lucky that you don't have to migrate. And that no crocodiles have come down here. See, all of the big creatures that we've got in this area they have learned that neither Vlad or boys and now crocodiles live in here so they approach the water far more freely than what we've seen them approach other water sources especially Chitwa Dam when we've had animals even we had that w wild dog sighting at Chitwa Dam a few weeks ago even when they start to come for a drink and now this is also a predator they approach the water so warily so scared that there's going to be anything there that might be able to get them so I think we're also looking at some very spoiled wildebeest. Because they know they can just come and have a drink. Ah, some head shaking there. Oxpeckers, yes, another bird for our list. Well done. The red-billed oxpecker, very loyal little creature. Robert, you're wondering what's the difference between a wildebeest and a buffalo? Well, all right, I think the easiest way to show you this is perhaps to try and get my book out because they're very different creatures. Now, both of them will have horns, the males and the females, and they are somewhat similar shape. And then, of course, they are both of that um, dark color. But the buffalo are much bigger in size and are potentially dangerous to humans on foot, whereas the wildebeest, not so much. They could be, I mean, if you found yourself on the wrong side of a wildebeest, but they are not as aggressive as a buffalo could be. Now, I have found the wildebeest on the book. Just need to find the buffalo. I wonder why my little trustworthy mammals book has got all the names in... in what's the name of this language? German. All right, B for buffalo. <laughs> Someone's having a lot of fun. Probably they'll have far few or fewer ticks on top of them now that they've been all dust bathing and putting some mud on top of them and cooling down and if we were to walk there who knows maybe we would find lots of ticks now i haven't forgotten about the difference between the buffalo and the wildebeest i'm just sticking with the wildebeest for a little moment just to see if they do anything else that's quite interesting because this is very unusual well it's not unusual behavior but we don't always capture it on camera when they start using their horns to to loosen the soil and then roll around almost like we saw that zebra do yesterday <laughs> it is quite a funny thing to watch isn't it ok 
here right now. I think maybe somebody's gonna push somebody else out of that spot. loosening the ground and just marking this is also what males do a lot of the times as a display so they'll do it in very obvious areas like an open area and they're gonna start digging like that and then just horning the ground and then m dust bathing and everything else just to prove a point and advertise their dominance in a particular area so they always make sure that they can do it in a spot where they can be seen whereas right now I think it's just more of a practical consideration what this wildebeest is doing <laughs> look at that belly I, don't, I would find it very hard to roll if I were them ah there's a blacksmith lapwing running around at the back so we can add another bird to our list thank you wildebeest that was most kind of you now let me just show you the difference between the buffalo and the wildebeest well, we still got them drinking water and they're being quite friendly to us. Now, let's put it here. So you see the face oh, of the wildebeest. And look how funny enough, all of them down in the water drinking. Now, you see, very characteristic, this very long, long face. This muzzle here, very dark in the horns. And then, of course, this beautiful big mane at the back. Now, let me just swap to buffalo just to show you what buffalo look like. So you see very different animal. Buffalo looks very much like a cow, very big ears, and then they've got this massive horns. Somewhat similar to the ones of the wildebeest, but maybe if we do this, that'll be easier. So the bottom. Look, time for you to cooperate with me. So you see, we've got here the difference in between the two of them. So the buffalo have got the horns, no mane on top here like we see on the wildebeest and on a much shorter face. So if you look at something that looks pretty much like an angry cow, likely that's the buffalo. If you look at something that looks something in between a cow and a horse, <laughs> that's a wildebeest. <laughs> All right, we're going to stick around here with the wildebeest, see what they get up to. But while we do that, let's go over to Taylor, find out how her tracking's going. Well, I don't know if you could call what we're doing right now tracking. <laughs> we don't have any more tracks, unfortunately, so we're bumbling. Sebastian and I are trying to think like Tandy now, but it's not really going according to plan. So her tracks, we saw where her tracks came from this morning. Right on Chitwin New Driveway, but they come from even more south. So we're driving right into the boundary of, of Chitwa and what I'm hoping, oh hello Koki Franklin, what I'm hoping is not going to happen is that I'm going to end up on another property that I shouldn't be driving on because I, the, I don't know where all of these roads go to so I just take my chances. Where'd you go Koki Franklin? There was one here, let me see if I can hear it moving through the grass. Hmm, it's been very quiet. I think it's gone with the freeze maneuver. It is now hiding away from us. But it was beautiful. It was a male Koki Franklin. Where did you go? I can hear the rustling. Is it over there? I just heard some movement through the leaves. Let me go forward. I think I can, I think I can see it. That's amazing. It's only taken about two steps off of the road, but now it's completely invisible in this grass. I can't see it anymore. I can hear it moving though, I can hear it. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay, I don't think we're going to get that Koki Franklin. We've been outwitted by a bird. We won't brag about that though. What little footprints? Lots of Janets walking here last night. Okay, now we need to find a road that looks familiar because this does not look familiar anymore. Hmm. But we'll keep searching anyway on the tops of the termite mounds and the trees. We'll keep searching for tracks. And of course, we're still on our bird search. And hyenas were running up and down here at 1.2. 
Mm -hmm. Right. We might have to turn back and go on the same road that we've just come from. But I can't imagine we're, we're driving anywhere we're not supposed to be driving just yet. I don't know where we are. <laughs> Right, before the gremlins attack us, they obviously also know that we lost. I'm going to send you back across to Ali and her wildebeest. The wildebeest have all of a sudden decided to start running in the wrong direction. I wonder what it is that they've picked up that they didn't like. I do know that there's what seems to be a bull away from all of them, so maybe they've just decided that they don't want to be hurtin by a boy? Hmm, I don't know worth sticking around here and finding out what it is that's happening. It's been the day of mysteries today. Now while we're here, we might as well try to do some birding, see who else is around and what else we can find, because there are some Egyptian geese down in the water. Whew. Lucky spot in between all the thorns, yes! Lots of them around here. Hmm. Not too much of a great variety from what I can see. But it also seems like maybe perhaps a bit to the left of where it is, towards the back, a little bit up. There it is, that's a Hadida Ibis that we've got there, probing and looking for food. I think there's actually a pair of them, so the usual pair that lives around here. Interesting, guys. Oh, it seems like our wildebeest are not done with the water and the mud, are they? Perhaps they were just not ready to leave. <laughs> yeah, of course I had to say this and then you're going the wrong way. I think it's quite a lovely afternoon for them to be able to do this. Just spending some time here doing something different. As we don't think that they were here yesterday, so maybe this is also quite an event for them. And off they go. Or at least it seems that they are going. Because they started going earlier on, but then they went into the wrong direction. Now you see those funny backs that they've got? Pretty much it reminds you almost of the shape of a hyena's body. And animals that are a bit built like that, it's so that they can have uh, spend a lot less energy, have more of a rocking motion for animals I need to perhaps walk for kilometers and kilometers on end. So I'm sure our friends in the Mara will tell you guys all about it because we'll see them when all of these wildebeest start congregating. And I think it's already, well, it's already started happening. The first ones have already arrived. And I'm sure as the days goes by, we would love to see them, all of them trying to cross the rivers and see that wonderful spectacle that the Great Migration can be. For now, I must say, I'm really enjoying our little Juma migration. <laughs> That's of a much smaller scale, but it, very wonderful to have so many wildebeest here. The first few weeks that I was here, I think we only had the one odd lonely bull around the dam every now and again, and perhaps the same one that we moved off to quarantine. But it seems like lots of ladies have come and joined, and I wonder where they've come from. I don't know if perhaps they came from Arathusa. I know that there were some wildebeest there, but it seems like now they're all here. Which is wonderful. Hmm. Try also to spot different birds around here. Jackie, you're wondering when the mating season for the wildebeest is. Well, I think it should be sometime around this, the winter time so that they give birth during the summer time. So that there's a lot more, what you call that? A lot more, it's easier for the mothers to, to raise their young because there will be more food readily available to all of them. 
Now, where did I put this book? Maybe I have lost it already. Sure, did I give you my book? No, here we go. Seems like Taylor has managed to find a side stride jackal, so let's go over to her and see this beautiful little creature. We do have a side striped jackal, but unfortunately it's not the happy sighting that I really wanted. This, you can see this, this poor fella does not look in the greatest condition. It's very mangy and itchy. It keeps shaking, it keeps rolling around in the grass, and it keeps scratching itself. It's not in the greatest condition. It actually looks quite thin too, which is a bit of a shame. Unfortunately, mange is a terrible killer. We've seen it quite a bit when it turns into psychoptic mange like it did with the Styx cubs. There's very, very little chance that you're going to come back from something like that. Now, this jackal shouldn't have mange at this time of the year. So to me, that says that there must be another underlying problem. It must be sick. I'm not sure what type of illness it might have, um, but mange is typically related to um, sort of um, when the immune system of an animal um, weakens, it'll, it'll come in and start to take over. So there's something else that's wrong with it too, but I'm not sure. There's also a lot of birds alarming. They've just started alarming now for the jackal, but I've been listening to them alarm right in front of the lodge so we will go down there and have a check too but you can see look at it it's lost quite a bit of hair on its tail it is very very itchy now i know it's so terrible and of course i'd want to go out there and bathe it in f10 um, but unfortunately i'm not going to be able to do that we do let nature take its course out here and not everything is meant to survive only the strongest and the fittest genes will make it through and unfortunately the rest will succumb to being eaten or to diseases and things like that, which is a tough life. It's like I always say, nature is not kind. It is quite cruel. Now, Stevie, you're wondering if this will spread to other jackals. It might, if it does have any other social interactions, it can indeed. So what mange actually is, is it's a mite that gets into the hair follicles and feeds on the hair follicles. That's why you start to see the hair disappearing and then you see the scabby skin that comes after that. So they will scratch and itch, roll around in the grass and do all those things. Um, so yes, it can, be, it can be contagious, but hopefully it doesn't, you know, sort of have too much other interactions with any other jackals because you'd hate for them to pass it on. But mange is also a really easy thing to beat. Um, if you are fit and strong, you know, you might get played by it slightly. Um, but, but you ca can get rid of it naturally all on its own. We saw that with the Nguhuma cubs. They're a perfect example. They had it in conjunction with a white muscle disease, uh, which is a lack of selenium and uh, a couple of other uh, minerals and vitamins too. And then the mange normally comes in after something like that too. But very, very sad though. That's just sitting off, very itchy, very scratchy. heart you're wondering if I if I'm sure that I don't think that it's very old it could be a combination so maybe it's an old jackal but it doesn't look healthy the fact that it's lost the hair on its tail uh, that says to me that there's definitely a skin condition uh, and, and if you saw it when it was standing up it looked it looked a little bit wobbly as well and its legs are starting to get quite patchy and quite scabby so maybe it is just an old jackal and mange is going to be the thing that takes it down if it's not going to be malnourishment because like I said it does look quite underweight as well so yeah so it could quite be but I, it's so difficult to tell uh, the side strike jackals are quite sort of gray in color so they almost look like they're old even when they're quite young they do they're, old, they're like the old man jackal the, the black back jackals um, with their coloration don't seem to have that look about, upon them but very sad though but Jackal, I'm sure you're making the best of what you have, but let's not dwell on the sad situation for too much longer. Let's let this poor fella scratch in peace. Let's go see what else we can find. Well, I'm sorry that it wasn't a healthy Jackal that I got to show you. The birds are going crazy down at the dam. I think we need to head that way and go and have a look. But we've got to go the scenic way around. Still no more developments on the on that leopard and obviously as you can see I didn't get lost because we're on the Chitra Chitra airstrip now. 
I thought I'd gone a little bit too far south, but I hadn't. I actually had probably about another kilometer of road to go. Um, but just to play it safe, I did turn around or take the next road. Okay, so we'll just... We see how fast the car can go. <laughs> we'll take off, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. This is your captain speaking, Taylor McCurdy. We'll be going on a flight this afternoon. It's a pretty fair day. The wind is starting to uh, pick up, uh, so please remember to keep your seat belts buckled. So yeah, should be a pilot. What am I doing in this career? I've picked the wrong thing. <laughs> right, me just being silly, of course. Uh, we're not going to be taking off. This is not a type of transformer aeroplane. Oh, look, Inyala. That's going to be nice. This looks like there's some big Inyala rams. You enjoy? Oh, we're flying. Nice, Sebastian. Look how creative you are. Shadows are taking off. Whee. <laughs> See, this is the type of thing we have to do to keep ourselves entertained when there's not too many animals around. <laughs> it's nice, we can have fun wherever we go. We don't need much to keep ourselves entertained. And crowned lapwings, I'm going to show you these in Yala because they're beautiful. I'm just crossing the road up ahead. I'm going to try and go stealth mode once I get over this bump. Switch off. Hello guys, where are you going to go? I'm going to come through this gap. I'm just going to see. I think they might come right here, just to the base of this Balanites tree. Isn't that lovely golden light that's starting to come through now too? And I'm also just going to have a little look around. Now, this is a young Inyala that's coming closer to the car. You can see the bigger boys just at the back in the lovely golden light. And there are three of them in wonderful condition. Now, they don't look like they've got mange at all. They're in much better nick than that jackal was. Head down on the ground. I think it might be actually looking for some Balanites fruit. It ha uh, they've unfortunately dropped most of them. because so I was checking a whole lot of Balanites the other day. And you could see where the grass was all flattened quite a bit. But you see that, how they've all got their heads down. And that's this big tree. And we've been seeing the elephants eating. Well, my last cycle, we were seeing the elephants feeding on the fruit of this tree quite often. Hippos will eat it. And as you can see, antelope will make a, a use of it too. It's obviously eating fruit is high in sugar. So it's a, it's a good energy source to give yourself a little boost. And they're actually quite determined. They keep coming round and round. But I think in Yala, I think that the elephants have probably got to this fruit before you. And their little trunks are able to reach underneath all the tall bits of grass. And of course, they've got a super sense of smell that so they would sniff those fruits out from anywhere. So sorry for you, Inyala. Well, unless you're just looking for perhaps some nice green leaves, maybe even some green shoots of grass. Occasionally, they'll also take grass, but they're predominantly browsers. And it's just stepping over there. Lots of thorns around there too. Yes, be careful you don't get prickled. But isn't that nice? Well, those birds seem to have stopped alarming as well. But we will go down and around to the dam and have a look if anything is that side. You fellas haven't seen anything this afternoon? Looks like it's like staring at something off into the distance. Smelling, listening. And now you're looking at us. Don't worry, we don't want to eat you. Beautiful striking markings though that the Inyala have. Though the kudu and the bushbuck are just as pretty too. It's almost quite difficult to try and choose between the three who's got the better looks. I mean, in terms of striking coloration, Inyala take the cake. They win first prize. And then, I don't know, who do you think after that? Kudu or Bushbuck, Seb? Bushbuck. Bushbuck and then Kudu. No. Oh, look at that. All three of them standing in a row. You've got youngest, to, closest to us. You've got a middle-aged one in the middle and then the big one right at the back. That was quite cool. All of different heights. Something, something they're not too keen on something in the distance. They're staring off to the left. Oh, it's <laughs> it's uh, people. <yeah. laughs> so they must be setting up. They've got a bush briar site not too far from here. So perhaps some of the guests are going to have dinner underneath the stars this evening. And that's what those Inyala are looking at. Not alarming, not making a, a barking sound, but just watching. And they don't normally alarm at humans. I've, I've noticed even when you're going on bush walks and things like that. I've never had uh, an Inyala or a Kudu or a Bushbuck bark at me, but they will most certainly bark at leopards, at lions, and they'll even bark at hyena and cheetah too. 
and off they go. They're going to walk past us. Come on, come and get illuminated by that lovely golden light. It's so pretty. This is my favorite spot out here. This is where I keep telling you all about uh, my, one of my favorite elephant sightings we had. Same, about the same time of the day, golden light, and a, quite a big herd of them moving through um, and amongst these are marulas. And there's nothing quite as pretty. And off they go. So quiet. A couple of also virtual starlings just down on the ground. And they'll be quite happy that the Inyala are walking straight in their pathway. Because they'll try and collect any of the insects that do jump up from the last grass. Off they go. Look at those dainty legs. These boots were made for walking. And that's just what they'll do. Because one of these days these boots are gonna walk all over you. Doom, 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 doom. I don't even know if those are the words of the song, but I tried my best there. <laughs> right, enough of the singing and our silly antics from Sebastian and I. I don't know why I'm in such a, a silly mood. We're gonna head down towards the dam and see what's lurking below the water. I'm gonna send you back across to Ali, who has moved away from her wildebeest friend. And I don't know what animal, what bird she's going to see next. Well, first of all, I need to try and get myself out of this road. <laughs> I would have paid some good money to see Taylor on the airstream pretending to be an airplane or a pilot or whatever it is that it was. I'm sure that was quite hilarious. N now, ooh, let me carry on. And then I think maybe we'll go check around Tamburti Dam in that area. Because I know that Mbula was seen somewhere around there. It has become slightly colder, so it's a good chance for him to start moving around. And then we'll double check around there, and if not, perhaps we'll just carry on around, see what else there is around here. It's been a bit of a quiet afternoon, other than that great wildebeest migration. I don't think there's too much happening at Juma, so luckily Taylor is on the way at Chitwa, and I wonder if she's going to go down to the dam and what she's going to be able to see over there, because lots of little things lurking around, and of course it would be quite nice to see, now that we've had the great Juma migration, to see the great Chitwa crocodile, because <laughs> he is a bit of a scary crocodile. I think Nile crocodiles are very feisty creatures. All right, now there were some birds fl that flow, flew, <laughs> if I can remember how to talk, into, ah, yes, do you see that on top of the tree there? I think they're all pretty much the same. It's probably the flock of the white crested helmet shrikes. Now I can only see that one on top there, so I wonder where the rest of its flock is, but I think it's the ones that I saw fluttering about. There we go. Oh, I thought you were all going to come into the same tree. All right, this doesn't seem to be a group of seven. <laughs> Just three of them flying all around the trees, but I think they've gone into a bit of a tricky spot. All right, but I definitely only saw three. So we do know now that they don't only occur in groups of seven. <laughs> Let's find out if maybe we can find a bird party somewhere around here. Some Rhett's helmet shrike would also be very nice. I am hoping that we're going to be able to see a flock of them, which is pretty much a dark version of the white crested helmet shrikes. They're very similar, they even make a similar noise, but the Rhett's helmet shrikes, they are entirely black and have a red eye. So similar shape to the ones that we were looking at, but not quite. Now I'm hoping for any other little creatures. Sir, do you want to see a fire finch or you're wondering if it's possible to see a fire finch? It is possible, however, it's tricky. So they're very small little birds and they are often in the bushes. So I was hoping we were going to get some earlier because they're the same, roughly the size of a wax bill. But uh, we will be on the lookout for them. Hopefully we'll see them because they are pretty tiny little creatures and beautiful colors. So I'll keep my eyes open for some of the smaller ones as well. 
I want to find out where all of the birds are hiding because we only found one spot and we could hear them all around us and there was a nice big bird party around there but they were all quite quiet uh, sorry quite elusive in the sense that they were all going into the thickets now let's Mm, I think maybe we should go into the western side Drive into the sunshine see if perhaps anything is being attracted to The big flame that is the Sun Maybe we'll see anything else there Let's you're wondering if we see glossy ibis in the savvy sand uh, We don't see them here I think they occur further north towards Botswana and that general area but let's have quickly a look around in the book and then we'll be able to find out I think Botswana is the area where they start occurring and we don't see them around here but I have the feeling that maybe somewhere around um, Johannesburg and that sort of general area so let's double check all right so the glossy ibis, the bottom one here. Now, it could occur here. It is, according to my trusty bird guide, a common resident around lakes, dams, and pans. However, I haven't seen a glossy ibis over here, and I've actually marked it in my book that the only place where I have seen a glossy ibis was in northern Botswana. So if you see the distribution here, this is roughly where it tells you where there's been areas where they are a bit more common are marked in dark green and then areas where they are not so easy to spot are in light green now we are roughly in this little section over here i know it's a bit hard to get an idea with my fat fingers in there but you get the spot so the lighter the clearer uh green area and then obviously my beautiful writing that is not that pretty you should see tristan's that says that a first one that i ever saw was in chobi in 2013 and i think that was actually the first time that i ever went to chobi which is a few years ago now definitely need to head back up there soon it is one of the most spectacular national parks that i've seen and just seeing all of this quantity of elephants so if you're an elephant lover chobi is probably the place to go and especially when the water level is low because you'll see thousands of elephants well maybe not thousands but definitely hundreds of them just coming down the water to drink and then they feed on the reeds and you'll see the little ones playing and lots of hippos and of course the bird life is incredible over there so i think it's one of my favorite places on earth chobi national park and then of course you can do self-drive but it's very rustic there it's not like the accommodations that you would get if you come into the Kruger National Park where it's a lot more civilized Chobe still has a very much wild feeling to it isn't like well if you come across a camping site there might or might not be someone looking after it and do not get out of your tent because you will get eaten type of thing so <laughs> but it is a wonderful national park now I'm gonna go check around Tamboti Dam, see if perhaps there were any signs of Mbola coming down. I do know that there were some people that went and looked for him earlier on, but with no luck. So I'm hoping that maybe we will see some signs of him. If not, then I think we're gonna drive onto the west, onto the setting sun, see if perhaps we can catch another beautiful sunset this afternoon. I'm still surprised when we timed it yesterday that it was just two minutes and 15 seconds. I, like, I would have given it at least five not so little that was <laughs> an eye-opener i think it's you know very certified scientific trustworthy proof that when the sun goes down it doesn't just go down it sinks completely in one go now tamboti dam is still a bit further along the road come and bulla we want to see how you're doing Misha, you're wondering how big the property that I'm allowed to drive on is. Well, Juma is around 880 hectares, and then we can also drive on Chitra, that's about 400. So we have an area of about 1,200 
yeah, around about there, hectares that we can drive upon, which is, in the bigger scheme of things, not the biggest area around, but I think we have some amazing animal density. I mean, just look at the last few days, all of the cats that we've been able to see. It's been wonderful. Ah, some kudu down the road. Hello, girls. Are you heading towards Tamboti Dam as well? I think maybe Tamboti Dam is the place to check. Kudus are going there, apparently there was a leopard there. Hmm. Oh, a nice big bull over here. Good, we haven't seen a bull in a while. Hello. Oh, look at that beautiful setting, isn't it stunning? It almost seems like something from a book cover. That beautiful blue sky that there was earlier on. I think there might be another bull coming behind this one. And it's a bit of a tense time for male kudu this time of the year because it's the time where they start competing for the mating rights and as well fighting each other for those mating rights. Funny enough, I so i've only seen kudus fight twice and the second time that i saw them was not too long ago and was here on juma and they were properly going at each other and i was secretly hoping that they would get their hordes tangled up just to see how it happens and how they untangle themselves but um they were being very careful about the way that they were doing things now there's a beautiful girl in half the golden light those beautiful markings on the side was just giving me a bit of an attitude turn around typical model face like oh, I'm too pretty for you <laughs> bye bye kudu girl seems like the boy over here is being a bit too shy so I'm gonna leave him and carry on towards Tamboti Dam seems like Taylor though has managed to find some of my favorite tiny little creatures so let's go over to her we have Annie we have found one of your favorite little creatures it is of course oh I just heard something it's birds also in the grass we are looking at dwarf mongoose, a whole family of them. Aren't they so precious? They are just getting ready to go to sleep now though. Look at those little ones. There's two of them. They are so small. The one at the top left is quite funny too. It was biting its feet just a moment ago. Perhaps it was a little grassy something stuck in between the pads of its feet because that sometimes happens. But the sun is slowly starting to disappear. You can starting to disappear. You can see the last bit of golden light is just there where they have a little midden. That's where they use the luxury facilities. Oh, we have a demonstration this afternoon too. How fantastic. You are well trained. You get 10 out of 10 for that. Very well done. <laughs> Not a little mongoose. That's an adult mongoose. That's, um, I'm just going to turn my radio down, sorry. Just having a quick groom, enjoying the golden light. One last bit of interactivity between one another before they actually decide to go back to bed. And there's a few more little ones down on the ground, right at the base of the mound. You might see just to the little bit to the right. There they are. There's another little one following an adult around. Wee! Very quick zipping up that mound. Are you going to go into that little burrow? Maybe. They are so precious. Now I love little mongoose and we actually haven't had any spectacular sightings over the last uh, couple of weeks. It's been quite quiet with the mongoose, but I'm glad that they're back. Oh, you see them cower a little bit there, just because if you have a look just above them, look at the magpie shrike, just up and to the left from where they are. Look at that. So how amazing is this little relationship that they have? Now machine gun nest, you say they're just going about their business. They are indeed. And they're going about their business now with a magpie shrike. And it's not actually uncommon to see uh, relationships between birds and mammals. We see it with a number of different ones. For example, the most iconic in a sort of symbiotic relationship has to be with the ox peckers with the various mammal species acting as their personal grooming service. Now, the magpie shrike is not doing that. It's just hoping that as the mongoose move around in the grass, like what we saw with the Inyala and the virtual starlings, they'll also kick up insects and they'll hope that, the, or the magpie shrikes will hope that they get the insect before the mongoose does, because that's what they're feeding on. They feed on little invertebrates. 
But look at that, they have very little light on their mound now, so they won't be getting warmth. They might be absorbing some of the, the warmth from the mound itself, but it will be nice and toasty inside there. Look at them, all, all grooming each other. And because they're so social, it is very important that they're constantly reassuring the bonds between one another, so grooming is the perfect is the perfect way to do so. Ah, oh, Beard, we haven't heard from you in a while. It's great to hear. Uh, well, it's great to hear your name again. You've said that uh, you love just watching these little guys. They are. It's, it's great. Now, there's a bird that's shouting about, and you can see it's definitely got one of the adult's attention as it keeps looking around, the one on the left, looking up. It jumped up a little bit higher. Just making sure. So that even though they are grooming each other and their day is about to come to an end when they'll go back inside, they've got to be careful because it's still a perfect opportunity for a small raptor of some sort to come swooping down and snatch one of those bundles of joy up. And that would be terrible for us to see because they are, they are very cute animals, these guys. Look at them, they're so small. And the smallest little carnivore that we have out here. But they're very entertaining, don't you think? You can really just sit here and watch watch them. And one of the most amazing things to do is to actually go and perch yourself right down below that mound. I like to do it first thing in the morning and then they're often when they become relaxed, they'll just come and walk around you. They won't really touch you, but they become quite curious. Well, the magpie shrikes are loving the mongoose this afternoon. There were a whole lot of them uh, laying around in this area. And you can actually hear them. I'm gonna sit quietly because you might be able to hear them sort of squeaking about or communicating with one another. It's a very soft and subtle noise that they make. It sounds like little birds that are chirping at each other constantly. Oh, isn't that lovely? Scratch, scratch, scratch. Let me get those fleas and also eat it as a snack. Everyone else has gone on one last adventure, it seems. Very itchy. Now, we were talking about the other day when we were watching Mvula, um, as he was sitting very patiently at the edge of that warthog burrow. Well, we didn't know at the time that there was actually a warthog inside there and we're, we're talking about animals that use burrows to house themselves. So you can imagine there will be quite a, quite a bit of parasites also. The same thing as a aardvark or a warthog burrow, the same thing will be happening inside this termite mound with all these mongoose living here. There are going to be quite a few parasites. So they move quite often. They don't necessarily stay in the same spot. They might have a couple of termite mounds that they're utilizing within their territory. So yes, mongoose are actually territorial. Well, in the case of the dwarf mongoose, they have little territories too, not particularly big. Um, I wouldn't imagine, I wouldn't actually imagine how big their territories are. Cat smuggle, you're wondering what happened to the termites? They'll probably still be in there. Uh, I don't think that this termite mound's necessarily inactive. They might just be living underground. Uh, they, they have a, an understanding. Uh, mongoose will eat termites though. So you might find that they're just living in other, other little cavities of this mound, but they do live with one another to an extent. Um, these mongoose though, would love to eat the alates, as do the rest of the creatures out in the bush. They're full of protein, full of fat, a very, a very good treat to feed upon, but there's no alates at the moment. They are the princes and the princesses of the termites, the flying ants, as they're also known as. We'll only start to see them again, those beautiful booms um, of all those insects towards the end of this year once we get a, a decent amount of rain. We actually only saw it quite late this year just because we did have late rains. And it's lovely. Now we still haven't had much luck with our leopard search. It seems as though everybody's getting ready to go back to bed now. I want it while we've still got a bit of light. There's just one more road I want to check for tracks. And unfortunately it's quite difficult to check for tracks in the dark. Thank you, mongoose. Good night, be safe. I'll go around here. We actually saw mongoose the other day and we didn't stop for them because they were in the long grass and we were quite sad about it. And I'm glad that we didn't though because that was that's as good of a sighting as what you're going to get with mongoose. Out in the open, lots and lots of little interactions 
and difficult to try and spot them when they are running through this long grass. So when, when it is summer and you have had a bit of rain or you're coming into the dry season and the grass is still dropping, you've got to time it perfectly. So the best times to go to the mounds, just have a clear view of them, is first thing in the morning because they'll do exactly what the birds do, but they'll sit on top of their little termite mounds and huddle up and warm themselves up. And then, or at this time, just before the sun sets and they all come back again, there's a lilac breasted roller just up top here. And now, oh, never mind, it's just flown away. If you're wondering why I didn't stop at the dam, the dam is just down here. Unfortunately, there were guests having sundowners and I didn't want to go and disturb their beautiful view, but you've got a view of the dam from the other side. Right, now, Ali's been on a mission all day long. She's been trying to find hyenas. She's going back to the den now, and hopefully the adults will be back with the little ones, and they'll show their faces. Oh, my goodness. All right, guys. Fingers crossed they will be here, at least one of them and then we can sit here peacefully if there's one of the adults and then patiently wait to have a glimpse of the little one. I think this has been my equivalent of Taylor and Mvula and this is Ali and the hyenas. Patiently coming and checking and waiting and seeing them. Come along. All right, so I spoke to one of the guys that was here earlier and he mentioned that one of the adults is here somewhere. <gasps> There's a little one! <laughs> so excited! <laughs> Hello! Oh, this is so nice! You are also very curious. Taylor was definitely right about you guys. No boundaries, hey? Oh, and you smell like a proper hyena too. Now, it's a very strong smell. Oh my god, this is like a tiny teddy bear. I am so excited. Hello, little one. Now, I believe, if I am not mistaken, that this cub was born roughly around December. I think that's what Taylor was saying to me earlier. But by all means, if you've got any more information about who this is and how old it is, please feel free to send it using the hashtag Safari Live, as I am very, very, very excited to be here with this little fluffy hyena who's just starting to turn whitish and it's losing all that baby colors, all that black that they're born with and it's spots starting to come through very beautifully. Hello. You are very curious. Huh. And such beautifully round ears. I think that's one of the things that always gets my attention in terms of hyena when they're youngsters, it's almost they look so silky and velvety. And all that hair, that crazy hair. You are very cute. Now, when we were here earlier, there's another hole at the back of the of this termite mound, another hole that they seem to be using, which is pretty much just on the other side. So I just want to wait around for a little while, and if they don't come back around here, then I'm going to try and go around there, because I think the entrance that they're using is actually the other one, just judging by how much grass and leaves there, there are around here. And the other one's also a bit thicker, so it's a lot... it's a bit... Um, um, more covered for them to come in, in and just start looking for things. Linda, you're wondering where the other baby is. Um, I can't see it from here. Like I said, I think perhaps they are on the other side because there's another entrance that's covered by the bushes. So I think perhaps that's where all of them are. So I just want to wait for a little bit. Just give them a bit of a second to get used to our voice and everything that's happening around here like I said one of the other guides was here before us and he says that uh, he said that one of the adults was around here and was present so I'm just gonna wait for a little bit just maybe get our eyes used to it and if they're not here then we might just try driving around the back see if perhaps we can get a look from there because maybe that is the side that they're using the most
Chris Rogue, so you thank you for confirming that that is Intima, so Ribbon's uh, female cub. All right, so let's get to start placing all these things. I find it a lot easier to find out who's who and start learning their personalities and everything else once I manage to see them. So thank you very much for sending all that information. Um, would you mind just confirming how old this cub is? As I would say about five months old or so, just judging by the color of the spots, perhaps a bit younger than that because it's still looking quite dark. They normally start getting their, their spots or becoming a bit whitish once they're about, I would say, maybe three months old or so. And this one's got quite a bit of white already. Take care. Uh, you're wondering if that cub can eat meat yet. Well, definitely it can. And often uh, the mothers, or ribbon in this case, because we know who it is, would bring food onto the den. So it's not that common for them to actually come and get the cubs and then take them somewhere else, but it's a bit more common sometimes for them to bring the food around here. And I've seen it often in the dens that I've been where the mothers will bring sometimes um, buffalo legs and things like that. And as they start getting older and they don't uh, survive on meat anymore, because obviously they won't do it like every single time that they go hunting, that they'll bring something here for them to eat. Um, the little ones will start going and moving around uh, with the parents just looking for food. Not with the parents, with an adult looking for food. I think that's a bit more correct to say if I'm not mistaken. Nat, you're 10 years old and you're wondering if hyenas eat meat or if they eat plants too. Well, they are carnivorous animals, so their diet consists mainly of meat, but sometimes, like the lions and the leopards, if they have a bit of an upset stomach or if they're lacking some sort of gut bacteria, then they instinctively know to eat some plants, but it's not something that they do for any other purpose. Definitely not for nutritional purposes. They won't eat salad and meat like what we do. Now, I think it might be worth to try and go around, see if perhaps we can get a view of them on the other side. Because we went missioning around there this morning, because that's where the adult went. So I think maybe I'm gonna go around, see if they are there, and if they're if they're not there, then we're gonna leave. But awesome to have seen that curious little cub coming <laughs> to us. Now, let's just see. It is a bit thick around here, and it gets a bit tricky. But we'll go around and see if we can perhaps <laughs> see the other entrance. Sorry guys, I have to do the long turn around because I cannot go any closer because it's quite thick around here so I just want to make sure also that we keep a distance from them that will not bother them. Ah, there you are. And you are using this entrance, aren't you? <laughs> you are a very friendly hyena. Hello, Intima. You're feeling quite brave. As long as you don't pick up any bad habits of coming and eating our stuff in camp, we can be friends. Oh, I think my heart is melting right now. They're always so curious about the car, so she... Ooh. I think just the moving of my hair spooked it a little bit. Stella, you're wondering if they can whoop at this age. Um, they can make all sorts of noises, but not the big whooping sounds that we hear the adults make. They do more a bit of a laugh. You see how it's picking up all the scents? That's so very grown-up hyena of you. Now, like I was saying, they're very curious of the car tires, and I think maybe this one hasn't seen too many cars. And um, 
And they often come and try and chew them, funny enough, which is not ideal because we don't want them to pick up any bad habits, especially not when they're older with stronger teeth. And uh, I think it's the smells that attract them so much because there's the engine and the brake fluids and pretty much everything else around. Hello. This is super sweet. I am slightly concerned though that I cannot see any of the adults and I know maybe the other guys saw them but I wonder if perhaps the adult haven't haven't gone out patrolling. So I'm gonna maybe try and move a little bit further see if perhaps the adult is somewhere where the cub is but if it's not then I'm gonna leave the sighting because obviously this is a very curious little thing and I don't want it to come out because it's curious and now there's any potential danger around here. Now, unless we find one of the... Ooh. I'm dragging the whole tree with me. Alright, I've got to see this clearly what's happening. I think it's a bit high. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go a bit more towards this side. Whoop. Ah, there's the adult. Okay, good. Then we can stay. Perfect. I just see the belly of the adult in between the bushes. So it's having a good nap and not too far from the youngsters. So they have definitely been around here, which is good to know. And now I feel a lot more comfortable because I know the little one is being looked after. Now I can't see who it is from here. I would imagine perhaps Ribbon. If this youngster comes and starts wandering around here. <laughs> Very curious of everything that's around it while mom sleeps. Izzy, you're saying it's a very outgoing little one and that it's a personality for sure. I agree with you. Very curious and I think maybe it's going to start becoming one of my favorites soon. Oh, and I see another adult. Okay, so definitely two adults at the den. It's very hard to... I can just see a few spots not far from where we can see this one lying down. So it's good to know that two of them are here. And I do know that there's a tiny little cub somewhere around here as well, but it's not out. Seems like Justin Tima is the one that's missioning around. Perhaps because she's the oldest one, so <laughs> she's allowed some liberties. <laughs> Where are you going? That's not the best spot to go. can't see it anymore. I think perhaps it's gone around the mound again or close to, oh uh, no, close to one of the adults. Oh, you're coming back. Oh, you're so cute. Little Matilda, you're asking me to try and describe what hyenas smell like. Um, it's a very hard smell to try. It's very strong, but it's it's that kind of smell that I don't know. I don't. What? How would you explain what they smell like? It's um, they smell like honey badger, but then <laughs> I would have to explain what a honey badger smells like. Imagine a mix of like maybe some chemicals, strong chemicals and mud all mixed together and add some water into it. 
I think that's the best way that I can describe it. It's a very earthy smell, but it's not easy to, to pick up. And I think maybe the little one is calling from inside, because I think I've heard a few calls every now and again. And so maybe she's just waiting for a new partner in crime to start maybe chewing on some of the logs around here. I can definitely hear a little one crying inside of the mound. <laughs> but I don't think I don't think the females are quite ready. I mean, we saw them earlier today when they were just coming back to the den and even if we checked in the morning, they only arrived later on. So I think perhaps they're also a bit tired and that's why nobody's really paying attention to what the little one wants. Hello Antima. She's just behind us now, so I don't want to make any sudden movement so that it doesn't get spooked again. So I think earlier on, perhaps, my long hair gave it a bit of a fright. Where are you there? It's just, it's funny, it's being a little shocked now. It's going around the car, just mudding everything. As long as it doesn't start chewing any tracks, any tires, then we are fine. <laughs> Is it still back there? Yeah, it's just busy smelling the back of the car. I can't really see it anymore. But obviously I'm not going to move now because I don't want it to, <laughs> to get spooked or anything. And it's quite wonderful. I think they've... So there was another little one in the previous den, so I'm sure they've moved it, them all around here. And then as this one starts getting older, then they're going to start walking around with the parents but I think we still have a few months ahead of us where we're going to be able to enjoy all these tiny little hyenas coming into this den which is going to be pretty awesome now is it is it still behind us I think it's eyeing Gerd right now Gert. sorry I, I'm always going to get your name wrong No, as long as it doesn't chew anything, we're fine. <laughs> James, you're wondering what they would use as a den site if they didn't have a turbine mound. Well, a lot of the times um, animals also go into drainage lines, so the big dips where it's, there's very thick vegetation where it's hard to get and they will leave their little ones hidden perhaps underneath a fallen log or a fallen tree that's very, very nicely covered. Um, leopards, for example, if they don't have termite mounds or anything else, they also like big fallen over trees that have cavities in them. Often they'll leave the little ones there and so will hyenas. There's something that keeps moving around here and I don't know if it's a Franklin or if it's or if it's another hyena. Because I hear the grass move every now and again. Hmm. Iwi, you're wondering if hyenas belong to any... If they belong to the cat family or the dog family or if they're in their own species. Well, they are in their own species and they're only closely related to other hyenas around the world. Um, however, due to some genetic studies, it seems like they perhaps share more characteristics with cats rather than dogs. But they are a completely separate species with their own dynamics and completely gene uh, different genetic code. Now it seems like Intima got tired of inspecting us and now she's gone back. Now, Intima means dark in Shangan, if you were wondering why we're calling her that. <laughs> I think this is a typical time of the day where <laughs> the little one is bored and it, was ju it just wants someone to play with it. And the little cub that's in there won't come out until pretty much mom gives the command, but and the two adults that are here are too busy sleeping to move around. <laughs> So it's out of p playing partners. A bit too active or anything, aren't you? Um, Bart, Mark, you're wondering if the little cubs aren't at risk with the cats. They definitely can be. 
especially lions and leopards and but that's why the when the parents are around that's why this little one is being so brave and wandering off because it also knows that the parents will look after it or the adults will look after it however if they weren't around then it would probably wouldn't be as brave and it would be a lot more scared and stay inside of the den now they also choose dens like this one where they are chambers so the little ones can go further uh, underneath the den and they'll be protected if anything um, tries to come and get them from from the main axis so likely um, the hole that we're seeing as the entrance there are a few more chambers inside that other bigger creatures cannot get to so they're a bit safer here now if there were for example a very heavy uh, lion or leopard pressure in this particular area likely they would just take their cubs and move somewhere else where they deem that it would be a bit safer for them has she gone behind us again all right Let's see if see if it works Oh, there we go. So, just pretty much behind us. Or directly behind us. <laughs> oh, attacking a piece of grass. Oh, no, it's a twig. Very typical of these little ones is just biting <laughs> everything. Bobby, you're wondering what I would do if the cubs started chewing on the tires. Well, likely I would have to turn on the car just to try and, and start educating the hyena in terms of animal-human interactions. We don't want them to become too friendly with us. We want them to to know that they are sa safe around us, but we also have a comfort zone around them because it might not be a problem when they're small because it's still cute and they might not do anything, but if you imagine bigger hyenas and lots of them that come and do the same then it stops being funny so likely just turning on the vehicle would just you know give it a bit of a of a fright in the sense that it would just then keep its distance a bit from us but because it, it's pretty much keeping to its own and it's far away from us i don't think there's too much to worry about only if it started chewing the car to the point where i would get a bit worried of having a flat tire then maybe we would have to do so well, it's very important to maintain good relationships with them and just like we have to learn what their comfort zone is they have to also learn what our comfort zone is just so that we can all be around each other in the safest and most ethical and uh, I want to say like well for for all of us Shame, I see her and I see all my little <laughs> brothers and cousins when they were little and everybody else just was up to something and they're like oh, come on somebody wants to play with me hello i'm awake that's so fluffy Kristen, you're wondering how strong hyena cubs' jaws are. Well, considering hyenas have the strongest jaw bite of all the predators, or, or all the land predators, I should say, in the African bush, I reckon the bite of a little one is also very strong. Now, I don't have a specific number for you, but they can chew through so many things. Hello. Just smelling everything around us and it's more curiosity than anything else I think perhaps it hasn't seen vehicles for a little while so it's wondering what's happening and what is this definitely smelling the tires oh you are the sweetest thing Jenny, you're wondering if hyena cubs spend a lot of time by themselves. Well, they can. When the mothers or they go out hunting and they're still too small, they will not accompany them. So they can spend quite a long time on their own until the adults return to the den. I 
think it also heard whatever it is that was making a noise over there and it's gone off to investigate little Intima the Guardian or the Explorer. I think the Explorer might be better. Hm. What have you found there? Gary, you're wondering if these close encounters happen often. Um, I w if you if you mean regarding the little ones coming and inspecting the vehicles and being curious about them, yes, they happen every so often. But as 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 they get older, then they kind of lose interest in vehicles and in us. So they pretty much will start ignoring us. But when we come to den sites. Um, often the youngsters will be around us and because we limit the amount of vehicles around here it's also for for them to start feeling a bit more comfortable so they they come and explore and it's almost like a toy that doesn't really do anything very quickly they learn just to ignore it and carry on but they are definitely some of the most curious youngsters out there I see bunny you're wondering if the fur would be soft or wiry well it's soft ish when they're when they're young like the age that intima is but as they start becoming older then it starts never becomes truly wiry but it becomes uh rougher almost like you know if you've got a puppy or a kitten as they start getting older then their hair is not as nice as it, as it was when they were youngsters hmm. Right. Taylor is still busy tracking leopards, so let's go to her and see what she's up to. I was actually just having a quick listen to the radio. Funny thing that the radio, sometimes it gives you wonderful information, sometimes not. This time it has actually given me some interesting information. I was just listening to young Mike, he was chatting away, and it sounds like he's got some buffalo. And I think it actually could be the same buffalo that Gert and I were trying to put on camera for you yesterday afternoon, but they were just too far in the bushes. It sounds like they're still around Philemon's cut lines. I think that's where we will head to now. Just got to find the right road to get on. We're on Gauri Main. Um, but we spent quite a bit of time going up and down Gauri Main between the Mulwati and Cheetah cut line and then going into Chitwa towards the dam and back and forth because we're actually heading back to go into Juma and then I saw some fresh leopard tracks coming out of Juma. Sneaky, Tandy. She obviously did a loop and she crossed back out over our vehicle tracks and then went into little Gauri again. So we heard a squirrel alarming. We could see it sitting right on the top of a tree. But unfortunately, we didn't see anything. We just went up and down, but I did spot a bump into some landowners from Nsinga in Bif I think they're in Bifils, Bifils Hook. Anyways, and I'd said to them they were looking for a spot to have a sundowner. So I said, well, if you do stop in the area, keep a, an ear out because there's potentially a leopard around here. And there were lots of impala and kudu, so they were acting as our, well, I suppose our eyes to help us spot the predators too. They give their presence away. And I, I said to them, well, maybe, maybe this would be a good spot to sit because you could have a leopard r walk right past you. So we've left left the leopard situation in their hands and hopefully she does pop out again and then they'll call us back around but I'd like to go and visit these buffalo because we have not seen buffalo for quite some time now besides the ones that we saw yesterday it's not a big herd I think there's any we saw two dug boys I think Mike said there's about three of them we'll go give it a bash but we're on uh, Shibamu road now in case you were wondering this is also a good road for leopards, but I haven't seen tracks along here for the last couple of days. They've moved on to other spots. Well, I think coming down to check the, the southern section will be a good spot to check probably tomorrow morning. And also, actually, we, you know, I think we're gonna have to start our day tomorrow by driving, unless we hear the lions around camp, camp tonight, but going all the way from Gauri Gate and go straight up towards Cheetah Cut Line and just check Triple M and Gauri Main 
for potential predator tracks and particularly leopards and lions. I think that's going to be a good place to start but let's hope that we hear the lions around camp and they come onto Duma and find one of those buffalo. I haven't heard any updates unfortunately about the lions and uh, where they went to or if they made a kill or not. I haven't heard anything more. Right, not quite dark enough just yet to have the spotlight out but we'll just, we'll just bring it out just in case. Maybe we spot an early chameleon. Maybe a honey badger. This is also the road where I saw the honey badger the, uh, a few weeks ago. And they like to move around in the same areas. And it was about this time too. Maybe, uh, yeah, about this time. We will have a look. Hi Impala. A couple of Impala in the Timboti thicket behind us. I you thought you were putting your blanket on again. Where is your blankie, Sebastian? Oh, I also left my blankie at camp. I only can have a blankie in the morning. Yeah, the mornings are cold. The evenings are not too bad. You can get away with wearing shorts. Uh, it's getting chilly, but it's yeah, it's not it's not freezing. Wee, that was a bit bumpy. Okay, I'm just going very slowly here, though. I don't want to miss anything. Though I know what's going to happen. I'll, I'm going to call it right now. Is I'm going to spot a daker because there's a daker that lives just here between Philemon's Cutline and Shibama Road, and I always hit the brakes way too hard to get excited because I think it's the honey badger. Let's see if we're going to see the daker this evening. Nothing just yet. Maybe it's beneath me. Or just move somewhere else. That's also a case. Hello, Kobe, who is 15 years old. You're wondering, why do I have a radio in the car? Well, let me show you. This one, it says Rusty on it. This one is for final control. So. I can talk away to Alice. See, I'm talking to Alice now and she's probably getting annoyed with me. Put that one down. Should we do the same thing on the game drive? We won't do that on the game drive radio. <laughs> and then Kobe, this one is the game drive radio. So it's actually very important um, to have a game drive radio because like I was explaining the other day, we all work as a team when we're out on safari. We're all searching for animals and we want our fellow um, guides to see these animals that we find. Now, if I didn't have a radio, even my loud booming voice wouldn't travel far enough to announce to the rest of the guides driving on the property that I'd found something and I'd probably also scare the animal that I'd had away. So radio is the easiest way to communicate with each other. So not only is it for Juma, we've got different channels. So up here in the north, we have a northern channel um, that when you're driving on Juma and in Biffle's Hook, you'll use. And then if you go onto Simbambili and Arethusa and Elephant Plains, a little bit further that, down that way, you'll have a western channel. And then we have an eastern channel as well. So that's sort of uh, Little Gowrie, Chitwa, Cheetah Plains, Torchwood, those, those spots. And then the Torchwood also uses the northern channel a little bit too. So, it's important that you have got these sort of uh, different stations otherwise it would be so loud and confusing it would just be constant chatter on the radio and you hear me all the time I get annoyed with it and I always used to get in trouble as a guide because I'd just turn it off <laughs> I couldn't stand it and, I, and, and I'd just leave it and I'd just go and find my own animals and drive around in areas that nobody else was driving I was always the outcast I was always everywhere else but where the crowds were unless I was getting very desperate and my guests say hadn't seen a leopard or a lion then I would have to try and respond to those sightings otherwise I'd just prefer to find them all on my own. But the buffalo is apparently coming up towards quarantine so I'm just going to keep checking around here and we'll see if we can find these buffalo but Ali is having a good old time at the hyena den I know she's been well she's been trying quite hard now that you find these hyenas so without further ado let's go take another look well it seems like Antima has finally given up uh, given <laughs> given up on moving around and trying to wake up the adults and she got a bit tired and now she's busy suckling now I've been going around something I said earlier on in my head and I think I might have said it wrong so let me just set the record straight just in case um, so the hyenas, they, they will suckle their cubs for quite a long time, perhaps sometimes I think it's just over a year that they will suckle them and although sometimes they might bring little pieces of meat back to the dent, normally they do not because they, they do not regurgitate their food like the wild dogs do, so they also will start taking their little ones to some of the nearby kills to, to feed on food. 
uh, to feed on some of the food around here. So they they don't bring like big pieces of meat all around. Every now and again, you can come across perhaps a rib cage or just a leg of something that they've brought around. But it's not like they will actively go and take a big piece and bring it to the den for the cubs to eat. And so just as I said it, I think it came out wrong. So I just didn't want to give the wrong information out. <laughs> Now, they have very rich milk, and that's perhaps one of the reasons why they can afford not to bring the food back here, just take them sporadically out of the den once they reach a certain age from about, I think it's five, six months old or so, when they start moving around with their parents to nearby kills and then feeding off that meat and then coming back onto the den. I think it's a very peaceful time now for little Intima with Ribbon. I was wondering which one of these two that we were looking at was Ribbon. Because hyenas, unlike some of the other animals, like for example um, lions, and in this way they are somewhat similar to elephants, they will not suckle um, any cubs that are not their own, and neither will elephants. They will just suckle their own offspring. Sayed, you're wondering how many uh, how many cubs does a hyena produce in one single in one single litter? Uh, normally two. That's the most that they can have, and um, it gets a bit tricky because hyenas are a very hierarchical society, and it's ruled by very complex social um, structures. Sorry, I was thinking for maybe the right word. So every single female will be higher ranked than a male, but the daughters of the matriarch, which I think in this case are Ribbon, if I'm not mistaken, all her daughters will be higher ranked than the daughters of all the other hyenas that form part of this clan. Now, if she were to have two female cubs, then it does happen that the oldest cub or the bigger cub will kill the younger cub just because it would see it as direct competition. If it's a male cub, sometimes they have maybe a bit of a better chance of surviving because automatically the female cub will have a higher status than the male cub. So it's quite tricky. There are exceptions, obviously, all throughout, but uh, the hyena social structure is very, very complicated. It's very, it's all about who who's better ranked and about food research and very competitive more so than some of the other um, social animals that we get in this area. Now look at that, that is some great camouflage, just this very long grass is hiding or blending them perfectly well and as it starts getting darker it'll be harder to see them. But we have got the IR here that we are going to turn on so the hyenas do not see this light it's only for our camera benefit and we can see it a little bit better now I think I have lost them, I can't even see them now <laughs> I think we're looking in the wrong direction there I think it's a bit more to the right <laughs> how is that? we thought the IR was going to help us and now we've actually lost the hyenas <laughs> And they are straight. Yeah, no, they are there. Straight in front of us. There we go. <laughs> Who knew that even with the IR it was going to be complicated to see them. Now the other adult potentially is has got the other cub, but it has not woken up and the other one is too little and will not come out yet until given a signal by the parent. Perhaps it's still quite small. I haven't seen it yet, but Taylor did mention that it was still wobbly on its feet so I'm thinking a very tiny cub is in there <laughs> just the ears flicking very peacefully sleeping It seems like Taylor is becoming Indiana Taylor and she's got not the IR but a flashlight, perhaps a spotlight. So let's go over to her and see where where she's headed and what she's looking for. We're smelling at the moment. Sebastian and I keep smelling a delicious fragrance coming from 
the bushes, but we can't work out what it is. We keep searching. It smells like something with white flowers. It's got that very sort of jasmine tinge to it. Yeah. See, there it is again. Yeah. Now you can't all smell it. It's delicious. I wonder. I wonder if the um, maybe the num nums have started getting their flowers because they smell quite nice. Oh, it's delicious. Hmm, I don't know what it is. Anyway, we'll have to come walk around here and find it because it seems as though just looking into the bushes is not working. Now, I've been working on a new number one single for July 2017 and a, I think it's a chameleon song version three now. <laughs> I was singing it to Sebastian, I was making it up as we were driving along. Alice and Megan, are you ready? I'm talking to the directors now. Oh, oh no, that doesn't sound too convincing. Alice, you're supposed to pipe me up and say, yeah, Taylor, you go, girl. And she's gone, she's gone, oh boy. <laughs> like it's going to be another disaster. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, let me try this one. <clears throat> Version three, chameleon song, take one. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, chameleon. Where have you been? It has been way too cold. Are you hiding at the base of the trees? Under all the leaves, where have you been? Now I know this is not the words of the song or the tune because I'm gonna make it my own. I don't know why I'm rapping. This doesn't make any sense. So I'm probably just gonna stop singing now and that's the end. <laughs> there we go. Ah, yes, I think I've had way too much sugar today. <laughs> and then this is a comment from Megan who's D2 today she's in final control she says what a rock star thank you Megan I shall give you my autograph later uh, I'll, actually I'll give you a, um, you'll get the first CD and I'll sign the cover for you it will be me with a chameleon I don't know what the, what the cover of that is going to be now I'm still looking for these buffalo and a chameleon we've seen as I'm singing the songs but I'm not having much luck out here just yet and we'll keep looking, keep scanning. Mike said that they were slowly making their way up towards quarantine. I think I'm actually going to have to go the other way. I'm, I'm making wrong turns here. We will go around. Oh, just watch out for that big stump. And this is also a good area. We've seen lots of bush babies around here. I'm looking for bush babies too. Maybe a white-tailed mongoose. That would be quite special and I'm sure that you would all enjoy an owl sighting of some sort whether it's a rose eagle owl, perhaps a spotted eagle owl, pearl spotted owlet, barred owlet. Oh and Kobe and Mercedes were wondering or not wondering you would love to see bush babies. Well we'll do a search. I thought I'd picked up a branch I haven't it's just the grass touching my tires. No that's elephant dung. And we also didn't find our elephant Yes, buffalo, I think. Oh, that's so disappointing. I thought that that was a buffalo. Oh man, it's not though. Let me show you what I saw. We'll go down here. Maybe it is still a buffalo. Looks like horns and then a dark sort of patch. And I think it's just a tree, maybe it's burnt. Let me show you what I saw, but from the distance. Now bear in mind, I was looking behind leaves, so it is quite easy to mistake in it, but it was just the perfect height as well. So you see this first little branch here that I've got the light directly on, from a distance and, and amongst all the silver cluster leaves that actually look like the shape of the horns. It uh, is a buffalo, Taylor. Is it a buffalo? It oh my gosh, what kind of buffalo, Sebastian? Dumb. Juma, Juma <laughs> we'll just pretend it's um it's still trying to recover from the drought this one it's very thin <laughs> right no it's not a buffalo eye. that's his eye says sebastian mm. it's just what a cyclops buffalo okay, now it looks more like a rhino to me. Yeah. <laughs> if you're creative actually funny funny enough i've had guests and one of their goals was to go around and try and find animals within the, the trees. So you know how you get these amazing knots on, on the different trunks of the trees and some of them create pictures or any shape of wood. And this is because of Earth Lodge at Sabi Sabi. They've decorated um, basically the entire lodge with all driftwood that washed down in a flood in 2000, 
2000 and long ago, 2002, it was the big ones, even further away. <laughs> and, um, and basically, some of these things, one looked like a rhino, one looked like a crocodile, the other one looked like a giraffe drinking. So they obviously got that idea. And we did, we found some amazing things. Maybe we must try and do that one day, is actually start, when it's a bit quiet and the animals aren't um, sort of around, we can play a game and we can see how many objects we can find that look like animals. And we'll just pretend that they're the real thing. Right, let me, sorry, let me just turn around here. Let's go back. Yeah. We'll go back down Philemon's cut line. I'm determined to find these buffalo. And, as all of you know, it's my favorite comedian spot too. I'm often quite lucky around here when we'll search. Oh, no, just lots of impala. Let me turn those lights off so I don't blind them. Well, not blind them, but just disorientate them. Impala, have you seen where those buffalo went? No? Just gonna pass the Impala, you'll just see them over here. Hi guys, good evening. Are you heading up to quarantine? Be safe. Look out for the leopards and the hyenas. They seem to be enjoying Impala at the moment. Oh my goodness, it's a long line of Impala. They're still going. Daniel, who is 14, you said, what is the the best thing that I've seen besides baby elephants. Is that correct, Alice? The best thing that I've seen? Oh, his best thing. What is mine? Okay, so Daniel's is... Here, the buffalo are here now. There's dung on the road. I don't know where they've gone. They're sneaky. But there's, there's the dung. Look, Sebastian. Let's show them everyone buffalo dung because we haven't seen any signs of them for such a long time. I must have, must have just missed it. That's very fresh. And their tracks are very fresh too, over the top of mine. So I keep missing them. Daniel, hmm. Well, buffalo dung's not my favorite thing. I can tell you that right now. There's even a few flies on there. No. Sebastian, that's terrible. He's just, he's put me off chocolate mousse for the rest of my life now, because that's what Sebastian says that that buffalo dung looks like. No. <laughs> oh, goodness, right. Let's carry on. Oh, they're gone in here. So their tracks cross here. Let's just check. Might have to go down the road. Daniel, I'm thinking, what is the best thing that I've seen? I also like baby elephants. Um, I like, no, you know what? That hyena sighting we had today of that young fluffy cub that you're sitting watching with Addy was running around in circles like a race car. Like it, well, it thought it was a race car. And, um, and then it was jumping up against one of the adults and pushing off and bouncing back. So that was quite cool. I enjoyed that. So I'm going to say the baby hyenas are my best. Now, where are these buffalo? I'm still looking for the buffalo and I'm going to keep searching. Hopefully we're going to find them. Maybe they pop out of the thicket. Ali is playing the patience game with the hyenas. Infrared is on. Will they come out? I'm not sure. You'll have to just join her and wait and see. Well, they haven't come out and, and Tima is still busy suckling, which is hyena cubs can do for extended periods of time. So I think maybe this is her way pretty much calling it a night. She hasn't moved one inch and I had hoped that whoever it is that's at the back that we haven't been able to see in terms of the adults might move around, perhaps the cub of the little one, and just call it out. But um, no such luck for now. It seems like... And Tima overexhausted herself running around that den and coming and inspecting us. So I think she's had a big day out in the real hyena world. And she's becoming very quickly an older hyena. So very sweet of her to have come and had seen us and allowed me to finally get to, to see her once more. Um, after the whole day because I even if she was like a little shark circling around the car I've been a bigger shark circling around the den just hoping to get a glimpse of them but it was all completely worth it for this amazing experience that we had a few seconds ago now I'm gonna stick around here for a few minutes see if perhaps anything else changes but if not then I think I'm just gonna leave them to their nighttime activities seems like Intima's too happy having some food finally who knows if maybe she was actually just circling around just trying to make time making sure that mom wouldn't push her away once she tried suckling <laughs> very tough spot in between the bushes there but you can see why it's such a good den for them as well it's very 
It's very hidden, very secluded, easy for the youngsters to be around and have different hideouts and even for the adults. So all they have to do is lay down and they'll be pretty invisible. MTR, you're wondering how long does a hyena sleep in the day? I'm not entirely sure. I imagine there are, there have been some studies done about it, but they are mostly active during the night. So I think they would sleep the vast majority of the day, perhaps anything to, from 8 to 10 hours during the day, and then a few hours into the night as well. Um, but definitely not as much as lions. Hyenas are always seen moving around and sometimes they have to walk quite far to be able to find food that they can either kill or scavenge um, from. So these hyenas, I know the adults have been here roughly since... What time did Taylor come around here? 8.39 in the morning and there are two adults that are here so I reckon they've been sleeping for the better part of the day. As who knows when they started moving, but like I said, we definitely saw them moving around around about... What time was it this morning when we saw them? Around about 7. After 6. Ah, oh, my bearings of times are completely wrong. So yeah, so they must have been moving from, let's say, early hours of the morning until around about 7.38ish before, before we saw them, perhaps around about 7.30, and they've been sleeping since. I'm sure they had quite an interesting night hunting and then finishing off that kill and coming back to the youngsters. But even when they arrived and we were here, when the when the adults arrived this morning, uh, they carried on going and there's a dam not too far from here. So I think they went down there for a drink and then came all the way back up here afterwards. Oh my goodness. Taylor, I think we're going to need to find you a new artistic or singer name. I'm going to leave this hyenas. Um, I think they have pretty much settled for the day. But let's go over to Taylor, who's apparently become a rap artist. Now I feel the pressure, Ali. We'll have to do a... Um a combined rap one of these days. I've actually never heard Ali sing, but I feel as though she's a sneaky shower singer. Uh, and what do you think, Sebastian? Have you heard her from Ingus? Yeah, every day she, when she showers. Every day she sings a song when she showers? Yeah, that's what I thought. Now, well, I feel as though I've been issued a challenge. My goodness, Wildebeest, why are you running so fast? What's happened? I think it's the little ones playing. Actually, you can just see it's quite difficult. Might, might be able to see a dust cloud from the wildebeest. We might see their silhouette. Yes, it is. It's the youngsters all playing about. You can see them there. I'm not really going to put the spotlight on them. Yes, they're bouncing. They're so excited. So just sort of as we saw with the, um, with the zebra earlier on today, racing about, the wildebeest have now decided to play. But what I was going to say to all of you, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep driving because I feel as though I get more inspiration when I drive. Um, if the challenge has come from our beard, and I don't know if he's realized what he's done, but you said that FC's panicking and saying, quickly, switch to Ali before Taylor starts singing a song about dung. Guess what? <laughs> I don't know how it's going to work out, but I tried to make one up very, very quickly. And it goes a little something like this. Now I've forgotten it. Now I'm going to get stage fright. I have to just sing the tune on my head. <laughs> okay. How did it go, Sebastian? Dung over here, dung over there, dung everywhere. Up in the trees, on the ground, maybe even in my hair. Ho! Oh, dung over here, dung over there. <laughs> I have to stop singing now. There's somebody having sundowners. So I just better be quiet and act civilized and like, pretend like I'm a professional field guard. Just, you know, it's not blind there. What? What? Up blinded them with the spotlight we'll just sneak past they probably already heard me singing my dung song and are cringing with embarrassment now luckily I don't get embarrassed okay just go past them we act normal nothing to see here 
Okay, now we can go lights on again. Off we go. Okay, so this is also another good area. I'm not going to finish the dung song because I don't actually have anything more to go with it. Sebastian, you don't have any songs? You've got a daughter. You should be filled with all sorts of wonderful tunes. You're a very bad singer. Do you think I sing well? Definitely not. No. Okay, well, you are the first one that's ever said that. <laughs> I'll beard you said that uh, you take it back you take it back okay fair enough well I, I, hopefully it was a good enough dung song I don't know how many songs about animal feces you've ever heard before but there we go might be your first one but yes but thank you Sebastian no one has ever told me that I sing well because I know I don't okay so so uh, Sebastian's daughter's name is Casey and he says that Casey will love it. So next time Casey comes to visit, which will be next weekend, hey, I will sing. Sing Casey all the songs. I'll practice on her and then she can give me her verdict and tell me which ones are suitable for game drive. We'll do that. But they, they're so spontaneous though. I never remember the lyrics. So I try and practice, like I'll try and make one up. Alice will say, we want you to do this. And then I'll go, okay, I'll try. And then the one that I've made up is always completely different to the one that I actually sing to you. And normally the first version is so much better. So perhaps I should just start making them up on the go instead of practicing. Oh, that was just a termite mount. <laughs> that gave me a bit of a fright. Lots of impala. I'm just looking for chameleons now, actually. But I don't seem to be uh, winning just yet. We'll go back past the wild wildebeest. What else? Oh, hello, scrub hair. Little scrub hairs running around. There's so many of them at the moment. Some in Yana. They're just feeding on some wild medlar. Impala's having a scratch. Whose eyes are those? And probably more impala in that thicket. Let's check up here. I can't believe we haven't seen a chameleon because it really isn't cold this evening. I mean, shorts, I've got this little poofy jacket on. Not doesn't really keep you too warm. I think I'm driving in my own dust, which is not great. Mm. One day, quarantine is going to be filled with all sorts of delightful nocturnal creatures. Just not this evening, unfortunately. Ooh. Apparently I might spot an Ellie. She says, she says she's coming over to hear me sing. We'll see if we can spot her first. Hello, wildebeest. They're behaving now. They've stopped running around and creating a dust cloud. Maybe it was the wildebeest dust cloud that I just drove through. Still can't find the buffalo. And um, we might see them actually at the dam. Keep an eye out on the dam cam this evening if you are going to be scrolling through it. Maybe three Duggar boys will make their way there. They seem to be heading straight in that direction. But they're still traveling through the block. I wasn't managed to pull, pull them out of my sleeve this evening, but we'll try again in the morning. Who else are we going to find? Should we give one last bash for bush babies? Check up in these marulas. Lots of impala. No. I think I'm, we're out of luck. Okay, this is another go-to spot. This is the area where we had the chameleon versus the katydid. But it did not catch the katydid. The katydid flew away. No chameleons. Right. Okay. I'm not having any luck and I'm giving Ali the slip. She's not allowed to find me. So I'm not telling her where I'm driving. But let's go back across to her and see where she thinks we are. Well, Sneaky Taylor, I know exactly where you are because I could see all her vehicle lights. The funny thing about these cars that we drive in is that they light up like a Christmas tree, just like Jamie used to say. So I can definitely see Taylor's light. Now, what Taylor doesn't know is that we are parked right exactly at the entrance of camp. You see, there's a Juma sign there. <laughs> so she's bound to come around this way sooner than later and when she is here we'll pounce on her and maybe give her a bit of a fright so we will patiently wait for Taylor here just like Mbulo waited for her <laughs> see if perhaps we can give her a fright Alice don't tell her we're here because we're gonna really try but I can't see her lights anymore hmm <laughs> hiding from Taylor 
We're ambushing Taylor. Right. I will let you know how this one plays out, but it's been wonderful to have you all on board today. We'll see you tomorrow morning for another wonderful afternoon here in the bush.